Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Carter. Please join me in our prayer. Father God, as we join together, dear Lord, we just come together in your presence. And we seek your guidance for compassion and for grace and mercy. We seek your guidance for open-mindedness. We seek your guidance for the tasks that come before us today, and dear Lord, to take care of the business of the citizens of Alamance County. We ask, Father, that you watch over all of us, keep us ever mindful of whose we are, keep us ever mindful, dear Lord, of the power that only you can bring. We ask, Father, that you bless the thoughts, deeds, actions, and words of our mouths, our th minds to your power, and we ask that you watch over us today. We ask all this, dear Lord, in Jesus' powerful and holy name. Amen. Amen. Join me in the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. It is morning somewhere. Yep. <laughs> okay. I need uh, a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And nobody's opposed in that. Everybody voted aye. Thank you. Unanimous. Okay, public speakers on the agenda. Um, I'm going to ask, and you'll be limited to three minutes, I'm going to ask that you um, announce first the topic on our agenda that you'll be speaking uh, about. Secondly, give your name, and the third, give your address. And we have on the agenda um, Ms. Wolves. Wow. W-O- L V E S. She's in the overflow room. Okay. Well, do you want me to stand anywhere? If you will, state which topic on our agenda you're speaking for. For the, the tiny home village for homeless veterans. All right. And give my name is Janelle Wolves. I was an aviation electrician's mate in the Navy. And your address? 6190 Cane Creek Court, Snow Thank Camp. I can't, I, can't, I can't possibly tell you in three minutes how much this is needed. I work with another advocacy group in California in the largest homeless veterans capital of the United States where they have roughly 5,000 homeless veterans. They just made their own version of a tiny village, but it's actually a joke. Little plastic boxes they put these guys in with a heater, an air conditioner, no water, no toilet, a t showers in a, in a truck that some of them can't even get to or got burned because it was all hot water. This is a big reason for veteran suicide. There's about three or four main reasons for veteran suicide and homelessness is one of them. And I, ca I can't express to you how vital it is to be able to have a safe place to lay your head down and sleep, not worry about somebody robbing you or killing you or people attacking you for drugs or whatever because I've seen a lot of the videos out in California how bad it is out there it's terrible and you have COVID on top of that they don't get any help they don't get any recognition they fight with the VA it took me nine years for an appeal and these ladies here at the VSO are godsend to me help save my life and that is not an exaggeration because the other lady that was there before she might as well have not been there at all and they helped me a lot and this is very significant to get these guys in a home at least something out of the weather out of the rain and peace have some kind of peace because 
If y'all remember September 11th and what that felt like, I was on duty that day. If you remember the tension and the stress, just imagine living like that 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 365 days in a row and having most of the people you know might be sitting next to you in one second they're there and another second you're covered in pink mist where they used to be there. All kinds of things can trigger PTSD. It's one of those hidden injuries. They don't get a lot of help from the VA and pretty much what they get from the VA is a bucket a load of pills that turns them into zombies. They don't get a lot of help. I know because I went through that. I've been going to the VA since I got out of the Navy in 2002. I don't get sick because I don't go there. I get my glasses and I get one, two types of medication mailed to me. And for, I have video conference with a psychiatrist now once every six months. But I don't go there for anything because I'm, I'm afraid they'll kill me. And to, the, the stress that veterans are under tr with not having a home, not having all these things happening to them, and having the organization that's supposed to help them go out of their way and turn their backs. To me, VA stands for Valor Assassin. They don't hardly recognize burn pit, the trauma that, and damage that comes from inhaling all that poison. And they really need a place, a safe place. And being around a bunch of veterans really helps them. Is that my three minutes? Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank, Thank you. And for the rest of the veterans in this room, every one of you, thank you for your service. Yes. And sacrifice. <laughs> okay, uh, Doug, is it Fricker? I Fricker, yes, sir. Your handwriting is as bad as mine. That's real bad. <laughs> Mine's pretty bad, huh? despite the works in the room. State uh, the item on the agenda. The uh, Veteran Community Project. All right. And your name and address. Name is Douglas Fricker. Address is 132 Dakota Drive, Graham, North Carolina. Thank you. I'm. Uh, thank you for having. Thank you for my three minutes. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I'm also a veteran case manager for the Department of Commerce and the commander of the Burlington VFW Post 10607. I'm going to ask a few questions. If you can, please raise your hand if it applies and keep it up until it doesn't apply anymore. Who here is a veteran? Who has deployed to a combat zone? Who here knew they had a place to come back to when they returned from their deployment? Who had a place to live when they ended their service to their country? Who here has faced the fear of homelessness? Who here has been homeless? I have. Who else? She has. We have. We've been embarrassed and had too much pride and the lack of knowledge to ask for help. We have dug our way back up. We have fought to get back up. County commissioners, this is our country's, our county's chance to take a chance. We have organizations like the Department of Commerce, Veterans Bridge Home, Alco Vets, the County Veterans Service Offices, the American Legion, the VFW, in the trenches every day trying to make an impact, but we need an end game. We have an opportunity to help our homeless veteran population in Alamance County. A tiny home community for homeless veterans is a start to the end game. No veterans should be left behind. County commissioners and guests, it is time to take action. I leave you with this. Tonight, when we are eating dinner with our families or our friends, don't forget, and I mean never forget, that a homeless veteran may be walking past you on the street, maybe sleeping on a park bench. That veteran who has fought for your, your our freedom and for, this, and for this country just so they can be ignored by so many, by people in power, by people in politics, by people just here in, in the street. In, in local government and people, commoners, non-veterans, everybody, you must take action. If we don't take action at the, at the county level, no one else will. We have the opportunity to take a stand and start the end game. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The other speaker that we had on uh, has now been marked out, so I assume that would be during the public hearing. All right. So there are no others on the agenda.
are there any commissioner responses? Okay, we now have the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. And there are no opposed, so therefore it's unanimous. Thank you. Next thing on our agenda is the Elements County UDO Tax Amendment Section 6.5 Heavy Industrial Development and 7.2 Definitions. And Ms. Cottle? Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Tonight we are looking at a project that uh, Planning Board has been looking at for a little while and had created a subcommittee. These are text amendments to the Unified Development Ordinance as it pertains to the Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance and some definition sections. So what we have up on the screens for you tonight are the text amendments that we've you all had in your packets. It's the same thing, but this is just so everyone in the room knows what we're looking at. Um, this first page, there's no additional changes here. Uh, all the classes stay the same. On the next page, you'll see that the class three uh, industrial uses have changed from a 1,200 foot uh, land spacing to a 1,500 foot land spacing. Land spacing by definition in the ordinance is measured from the outside property line of development out on past that. So a setback is measured inside those property lines. The land spacing goes from the property line outward. <coughs> So we had a 1,200 foot setback or 1,200 foot land spacing and now we're pushing up to a 1,500 foot land spacing. Um, on the next page you'll see a land spacing waiver. This is completely new to the ordinance. Uh, your 2011 ordinance had a waiver policy that allowed adjoining property owners to sign off easements to meet the what was then a 2,000 foot land spacing from the center of operation. This kind of piggybacks that idea but handles it differently. Now you still have a land spacing, but this is a waiver that is handled through boards. So individual property owners don't sign off on this to get permission. Planning board will review and then board of commissioners make that final decision on any type of waiver for the land spacing. This follows what would be your variance process through the state law. You all have seen if, uh, at least one of those when you handled the garage earlier this year. Very similar process. It's quasi-judicial, it's evidentiary, it's a step above what would a normal hearing be. On purpose because to get some kind of land spacing waiver you really need a special situation to be able to get permission for that and that's the way the subcommittee felt that 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 needed some extra attention next page you're going make sure you're going a couple of pages you're going down to the intent to construct in public hearing and notice <coughs> there we go it's so 23 new packet right um, on here you see a couple changes here uh, we referenced the North Carolina General Statute 160D. We're taking this from a what is quasi-judicial hearing. Um, the needs and what we're looking at here is still a very technical review, so there was not really a need for quasi-judicial and really didn't meet that definition. So we took this down to what would be a regular public hearing like you're having tonight, and then we fill in what that law actually says about how we have to advertise it in um, applicants and everybody has to find out and we're following state statutes for public hearings as opposed to a quasi-judicial hearing that's all we changed these sections to read for um, on the next page under iii it says the planning board shall hold a quasi-judicial public hearing so we um, scratch that so it's just a regular public hearing still taking that quasi-judicial piece out of the approval process and then as we go a little bit further we kind of get out of section 6.5 no more edits in that but when then we move to article 7 there page, we are and that's 28. Um, page 28 evidently um this is definitions which is the back part of the um, unified development ordinance we needed to modify a few things to go along with what we had done on the front part so we already had construction activities defined and now we are modifying that definition to take operations out of construction activities. And then we added at the end, except those similar activities constitute operations as defined in the ordinance. And this is just helping enforcement, just clarifying what people would expect 
during when you're using these definitions and what not to expect to be going on when you're using these definitions. Um, the operations, you see that's completely highlighted. We actually don't have a current definition for operations in our unified development ordinance from any of the heavy industrial uh, ordinances we had had. So we put one in there. The manufacturing, production, processing of any goods, substances, food, products or articles for commercial purposes, other uses necessary for the business of the industry and include any storage or transportation associated with any such activity except the, to the extent the uses in storage or transportation are associated solely with construction activities. So we kind of made these two definitions work together so the ordinances made a little bit more sense. You can see legal's hands all over it. Yes, legal has been all the way through this with us along this journey. Uh, very fortunate to be able to have um, such a great legal team to help us get through all of this. Uh, the subcommittee also looked at sawmills and they wanted to modify that definition to say sawmills that are temporary, portable, or located on 10 acres or less and scratch out without permanent structures are excluded from this definition to kind of clarify exactly what sawmills they wanted to consider in the Haida and what maybe not to consider. And they found this to be much more appropriate, the temporary type uses they weren't really considering necessary to regulate in the Haida. That's all I have for y'all tonight, but if anybody has any questions. At this point, I think we need to go into the public hearing. Yes, sir. Correct? Yes. I do have one question. Oh, I'm sorry. I was waiting for these guys. Oh, okay. Um, what prompted these changes? So during the process of working with the quarry that came in in 2017, the ordinance has been updated a couple times and going through the kind of final process of what the operations permit side looks like and then through the zoning ordinance and the concern came up that Haida was really one of the strongest concerns during that process those kind of things triggered let's put it back to subcommittee and see what we can come up with in response to some public comments are these meant to be kind of like a light substitute for zoning I mean so zoning all these all these <laughs> all these everything like a fly can't fly past your tree if it's over 10 pounds. I mean, it's just all kind of stuff. I'm just curious, are we trying to do as much as we can in these ordinances and all this other stuff to kind of... It's a twofold. So zoning actually gives you the ability to say yes or no to a use. That we don't have. What you have is a technical review, and to make that technical review be what it needs to be to protect even citizens around or the county in general, to make sure the nuisance part of these uses is taken care of, that's kind of what we're writing towards. Okay, so 10 miles down the road from where, and I'm just asking questions. 10 miles down the road from the quarry, some geologist discovers gold. Mm. I mean, let's go big. Can there be a gold mine put there because there's no zoning? So it'd have to go through this heavy industrial, that's a mining permit for the okay. county, so it'd have to go through this process. But if there was, but is it mining, is it that a quarry because you're mining rock? We is have two different definitions by our oh, ordinance. Core. The state has some def different definitions than us. They give a mining permit for quarrying. We give a quarry permit and we give mining if it's mining. Okay. Our definitions just are different, but they're defined in the ordinance while we would call which one which. So if another rock thing was discovered 10 miles down the road, there could be another quarry just like the one that's down there now because we don't zone for that to protect that part of the county to have another situation like this. Right. As long as they meet the technical requirements or they have some kind of special need and y'all can give them permission on that can happen. There's no real restriction on what piece of land gets it just if you can meet the technical requirements. Because you don't buy a field thinking, I hope there's rock there. No, no. You, you probably buy a rock there because I'm going to blow it up and make a lot of stuff from it. I'm just curious because you just never know where these things are because who knew where this was? Well, see, this isn't that far from one of the old quarries that were down there, too. Yeah. They make great lakes. I've been swimming one. Oh, yeah. You can see all the way to the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's still, if you live there, it's different. Additionally, this also cleans up some of the legal issues such as quasi judicial, <laughs> for example. Mr. Chairman, a couple questions. Yes. Uh, Ms. Cattle, first question uh, relates to the land use spacing. What was the rationale for the choice of 1,500 feet on the class three? 
So, you know, the original, back in 2000, I won't say original, but the 2011 had a 2000 linear foot from center of operation. Right. So measure from center on what is not a square or a perfect circle makes it difficult. Right. A computer generated and this and that and the other. So they changed it to that 1200. But concerned that 1200 may not be enough, did a little investigating on some existing quarries in the county and how people around them and their distances and how they're affected. So that's how they came up with that 1500. Okay, just a more restrictive uh, measure than what was in the previous one. Mm -hmm. And just to know what was already being affected by existing quarries, that 1500 felt like a little better number. But it wouldn't just apply to quarries, it would apply to? All class All class threes, threes mm -hmm. with, a, with a provision that would allow for a change if, uh, if the commissioners approved it. Right. Question though about the land spacing waiver new language. There's been some talk um, in, in staff at the commissioner level about the possibility of creating a board of adjustment. Um, that's obviously we don't have that yet, but if we did, the, this language would not allow the board of adjustment to make a decision that or, ordinarily a board of adjustment might make. Should we consider adding language that says the board of commissioners or its designated entity or something like that? So I think, Natalia, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Deborah was working on what that language is supposed to be for if we decide to break that board of adjustment into a different board and how to handle that. But I think she's probably going to make the change in the front of the UDO that would apply throughout the UDO because there's other places where it says the same thing. But she'd have to work that language in. Yeah. Would, we need, would we need to change everything if we... If, the, if we decided to create a separate board of adjustment, would we have to change the whole high, the whole ordinance again? Uh, what Tanya, Ms. Cattle said that um, there's there's references to the decision-making bodies for certain decisions that currently is the Board of Commissioners because there is no board of adjustment. And so that would be changed in the first part, you know, of the ordinance if there is a board of adjustment created. Um, and so that could affect, that would apply to the rest of them. But to respond to your question, it does, it explicitly says Board of Commissioners because there is no Board of Adjustment currently. And um, you know, certainly that can be addressed when there is one. So cross that bridge and forget to it. <laughs> That's all. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you. I need a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. Any discussion? This is the, uh, as to the amendments to the Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Okay, we're now in the public hearing. Do we have speakers? as to the amendments to the Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm here to speak on okay, If you'll come around, please. Yeah. Each speaker in this public hearing is limited to five minutes. Okay. And state your name and address, please. Sure. Yes. And we charge extra for that. No. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, here, you can have it back. <laughs> <laughs> my, name, my name is Linda Lee. I live on 2639 Tobacco Road and Snow Camp. And thank you for hearing me today. And uh, I just have some questions and concerns. First, is the land spacing for the Class 3 heavy development. I supported the 2,000 feet spacing, but for some reason it was reduced to 1,500 feet. And I'm like, why? I heard that the county lawyers couldn't defend it. I still have not heard why they couldn't defend it. It was to my understanding there was a discussion engaged with David Owens, an expert in land use law in North Carolina, said that 2,000 foot can be defended. It is, it, and it was a recommendation coming out of those discussions. Now it's been reduced to 1,500 feet. 
This is unacceptable, and I support the 2,000 foot land use for heavy, heavy use industry. That was the first thing. The next issue is why I'm wondering why the current HIDO is not being enforced. There's evidence of violations of storm structures in maps submitted by LMS aggregates. Uh, the storm water measures are in violation of the 120 foot setback requirements. The insulation, the insulation of additional storm water protection ponds and storm structures into the 125 foot setbacks are a violation of the 2011 HIDO in which it allows only fencing and landscaping buffer. Why is the HIDO not being enforced? The county has these maps, so why? In addition, how long the quarry's been operating without an operating permit? When, when is the noise ordinance will be enforced for the quarry? The blast quarry continues to operate full scale outside of hours of operation designated in the county noise ordinance with multiple explosions being heard by residents for miles. These violations have repeatedly brought to attention to the planning director, the planning board, board commissioners, and the county sheriff has been ignored. However, the operations continue without any action by the Alamance County to force the operators to obey the law. Instead, the county gets given permission to bad operators to break the law, do as they please in our community. The citizens of Snow Camp are expected to follow the law, but big money corporation can do what they want. Our community needs protection. I grew up here. I was in the Air Force. I'm a veteran. I fought for this country. And I'm going to protect my home. Our community, our community needs to be protected. And it's important to see Snow Camp be designated as a rural preservation district through simple, simple zoning ordinance. In summary, I am more supportive of the 2,000 foot spacing for heavy three class development. I want to know why our current HIDO is not being enforced and why our bad operators are not being held accountable and why is our community are expecting to give, give, give and get nothing back. And our community it needs protection. Snow Camp was here before this was the United States of America. And my forefathers fought in the Battle of Alamance. <coughs> so I'm wondering why this is happening. And I have one last question. Who's really leading Alamance County government? Is it the lawyers and big money corporations? Because that's what I'm getting the feeling right now that the people I elected are not looking after my community's best interest. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Any other speakers regarding this open hearing? Yes, sir. All right, good to see you all again. My name is Trip Overholt. I live on Major Hill Road in Snow Camp. I'm sorry, give me your name again. Trip Overholt. Thank you. Um, just I think context is as important in content when you're making a presentation. So um, I just want to say that I think that I trust all of you, and I think all of you are probably doing a good job. Uh, the reason that I'm here is really one reason and one reason only, and that's that uh, I've invested my entire adult life in my property in Snow Camp, and I really love it. It's a really beautiful place, as have many people here. And the one thing that would ruin it for me would be if I had to smell, say, asphalt plant fumes all day long coming over my property. That's something that I, I don't want to be possible. And that's why I'm here right now. I don't want that to be possible. It's not, it's not happening now, but it's still possible given our current uh, reality in terms of our no zoning and uh, the legislation that we have in place. So 
There's a, when I was trying to get to the bottom of reality in terms of just like this reality that we're enjoying right now, there was something that used to keep coming up is this thing called the invalid question, which I didn't really realize was often in play when people are trying to get to the bottom of things. But the invalid question is when there's an assumption that's built into something that isn't true. And so it's impossible to get an accurate answer to that question. So for example, like if you say, what happens when you fall off uh, the edge of the earth? There's no valid question, answer to that question because the earth isn't flat, can't be fallen off of, right? So when we, when we ask the question, which would be better, a 1,200 foot setback or a 1,500 foot setback, it seems like a good question. It seems like maybe we can get a good answer from that. But the assumption that's built into it is that there's another number that isn't better that maybe you know we assume isn't defensible. So we got we got a um, we got a opinion on the part of legal that 2,000 feet wasn't defensible. But we're not we we have reason to believe that county legal may not be researching things as thoroughly as 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 possible. Maybe every time they're asked a question. So we did our own research into our own legal authorities, and they say 2,000 square feet is completely defensible. So I think in terms of our good governance, what we ought to really do is find out like what is possible actually to defend, what's reasonable, what do other municipalities do, and not just shoot from the hip and assume we've got a 1,200 or 1,500 setback option. We don't really have to make that decision tonight. I think it should be tabled and that we should consider the 2,000 feet, which I think would have some teeth in it. I think 2,000 feet would be a pretty good setback. I don't know that 1,500 actually does that much for us. So that's what I'd like to see. And the only thing I have to add is that um, this is just one piece. This is one good piece of what we need to be doing. I think this is a good thing that we're looking at this. I applaud it. I applaud your consideration of it. And I hope we can get this piece straight and a couple other little pieces we're working on. And then I am going to be able to rest at night knowing that I'm not going to be breathing fumes. And that's going to be a good feeling. So thank you. Appreciate it. And we thank you. Are there any other speakers? Just came through the door. Yeah. I think we've got one from my own. Good evening, and my name is Ron Spinhoven at 2709 Quakenbush Road in Snow Camp. And Ron, would you spell your last name for me? Yes, S-P-I-N-H-O-V-E-N. -E Thank you, sir. You're welcome. And um, I, I'd like to say that, just for, for the record, um, that I think we need to support, that's not why I'm here to talk, obviously, but need to support our veterans as much as possible. And I don't think we do a good enough job in this country. So I um, just wanted to make that statement off the bat and thank them for their service. Um, I'm, I'm here to read a letter uh, or a comment from Gary, Dr. Gary Ulickney, who <coughs> couldn't be here tonight because of, because of an illness. And um, some of these things have already been touched on, but there's some um, poignant information in here that might be uh, helpful. Uh, good evening. My name is Dr. Gary Ulickney, and I live in Snow Camp. And unfortunately, I'm under the weather. I can't be here in person, but I wholeheartedly support beefing up the Hido, as are most people in Snow Camp, as it relates to Class Three heavy heavy industry. I have been told that the original proposed spacing plan was 2,000 feet to the property line, but the county legal staff has said that it is indefensible. Two weeks ago, I met with David Owens and Adam Lovelady, both nonpartisan attorneys and land development experts at the UNC Institute of Government. Both of these gentlemen are national and statewide experts in land use policy, and I might add myself that um, they were, and Mr. Carter would remember that uh, David Owens presented to the commissioners uh, a, a year or so mm -hmm. ago when we were looking into um, land, spacing, land spacing and zoning and that sort of thing. Um, 
They have said in their passage of the state law 160D gives local governments increased flexibility in how ordinances and structured are structured and that the spacing requirements of 2,000 feet were defensible and that special use permits for class three heavy industry could be enacted by modifying the current HIDA. And they indicated that they would be happy to discuss this with the county planning and legal staff. And I have included their contact information below. A lot of, some of this has already been said, so I'm not, I'm not going to continue, and I'll spare you that. Uh, but it just reiterates some, some of the points that have made, been made by other speakers tonight, and including, and I'm, I do want to say that um, I, many of us there are in snow camp are quite upset about what's going on with the, with the quarry and their operating and how they're operating and how they're operating outside of the hours of the industrial or of the heavy industrial ordinance of 2011 uh, and nobody seems to want to do anything about it so we're not happy about that and i wanted to pass this out to you because it has the addresses uh contact information for um, Dr. Rollins and Adam Lovelady. And if you'll give that to the clerk after you complete your speaking, then she'll distribute it to all the board members. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, you. I'm through for tonight, and um, I do hope you, you consider the 2,000 foot spacing as opposed to 1,500. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Well. Just go around, if you will, and, or just hand it to the clerk. Either way, whatever's convenient. <laughs> I'm going to give it to you. Thank you. And then you're going to give it back to me. <laughs> yes, sir. I think you were nice. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Barry Tomlinson. I live at 420 Tom Boggs Road in beautiful Snowcat, North Carolina. I'm proud to live there. I'm proud of our community. And I don't have any notes. I just came to speak from my heart. Um, we have a lovely farm there. We, we've always enjoyed living in this community. And I just have some questions and some concerns uh, regarding the UDO. I too support the 2,000 foot setback. I think that it is fully defensible as has been laid out already. And in addition to that, let me just say that as a landowner, I recently wanted to put up a 12 by 12 shed checked into all the permitting and everything. That was not a problem because 12 by 12 is legally allowable without a permit. I wanted to put a light bulb in there. I had to get a permit. I had to go through all the permitting processes. I had to have all the inspections and everything else before I could have a light bulb installed. We have a mine operating in snow camp illegally because they are not permitted to do what they are doing and this Board of Commissioners is doing nothing about that. And I have great concerns about that. I wonder why you're protecting big money interests and, and not sticking up for the citizens of this county. We voted you in to look after our interests, and we would like for you to do that. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we thank you. Andrew, are you a speaker or? <laughs> Ladies first. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, but <laughs> what, what are the two of you oh, approach the <laughs> Henry's <laughs> always a gentleman. <laughs> Henry needs the exercise standing anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I needed to stand right about then anyway. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Duane and I live on Quakenbush Road, two seven zero five. And I'm here also to ask you, plead with you to please implement the 2,000 foot space, land spacing update to the UDO Hido. We really need this. We need as much space as possible between us and them. Um, we've already seen the devastation that's been caused just by this fly-by-night quarry operation. And, uh, and they don't even have an operating permit. Do they? They do not have an operating permit. 
yet they are operating. They are driving down the streets at 60 miles an hour. The speed limit's 45. Their loads are uncovered. They have no license plates on the back. You all received an invitation to our town hall listening session last week. Frankly, we should not have been the ones to be hosting the town hall listening session. And by the way, I'm representing myself as a landowner and Snow Camp Community Action Network. So Snow Camp Community Action Network hosted a town hall listening session to respond to the concerns of our community last week. And I, you know, wonder why, A, we're having to host these. Why aren't you hosting them? You know the outcry. You're getting the emails of complaints and concerns. It's been going on for a long time. So we hosted it. We invited all of you. And for whatever reason, you didn't show up. And that's all right, I guess. But maybe next time you will. Maybe you'll host. Please. So we had some pizza. We had some mingling. And then we had a presentation of a very simple proposed rural preservation plan. And of course, we want to share this with you. You would have seen the letter that was sent by Snow Camp Community Action Network a couple of weeks ago um, asking that we get on the agenda here with you all to present the plan. So I am formally requesting now to get on the agenda. And if there's some process we have to go through, I'd appreciate it if your clerk or whoever would follow up and give us the process. Your processes are not super clear. Not, a, not unusual in government, but anyway. So this plan would include only one district in, in the county, Snow Camp. Under the plan, class three heavy industry development would not be permitted. The ordinance would have no direct bearing on any other communities in Alamance County, but could be a model for others if they wanted. Could you repeat that, please? I'll repeat that. This proposed ordinance would have no direct bearing, if you were to adopt it, on any other communities in Alamance County. It would be specific to Snow Camp and could be a model to others if they wanted it. So it's specific to Snow Camp. It would declare Snow Camp a rural preservation district. <coughs> so we presented the summary of the new bare bones rural preservation ordinance. Um, we had a rigorous and informative session of comments afterwards by 45 plus attendees who attended. Some of the main concerns voiced, of course, we wanted to hear about the, the proposed ordinance, but what we heard is about the quarry and why we need this proposed ordinance. It's operating without a permit during hours that are outside those allows, allowed in the noise ordinance, which is not <coughs> being enforced. Hundreds of big trucks are carrying gravel to the Toyota mega site. Hmm. They're being followed. We have watchdogs in the community. We have upset community members who are following hundreds of trucks from Snow Camp to the mega site. And video. Some of it's been sent to you. Yep. Gravel trucks are tearing up our roads that are not built for industrial traffic. We have concerns about trucks passing school buses in front of Sylvan Elementary in the mornings. County officials are doing nothing to stop the quarry from breaking the law despite numerous documented complaints to the county planning director and I believe y'all copied. We've been copied on a lot of those also. Those living close to the quarry are terrified every time a blast occurs and some have documented damage to their homes. Residents uh, present were overwhelmingly vocal that we do not want any more heavy industry coming in and ruining the beauty, safety, and peacefulness of our area. We acknowledge that change is coming. We are not anti-growth. We are not no growth. We are about planned, intentional, thoughtful we thank you. growth. We thank you. Thank you very much and engagement with the community in the process. Mr. Vines. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Good. How are you, Commissioner? Hi, Henry. 
My name is Henry Vines. Uh, I live at 3450 Isley Drive in Snow Camp. Uh, commissioners, I was kind of sick, uh, skeptical of what I wanted to speak or not, but I, after thinking about this, um, I just got to say that I'm disappointed that in our planning board that they would present this forward to extend you know, the distance of 1,500 foot to 12, from 1,200 foot. When uh, they felt it was better and more appropriate to do away with going forward with the zoning that each one of you voted for. I don't understand how they can squash the zoning plans when you, five commissioners, give them direct instructions to formulate a zoning plan. If the zoning plan that was presented wasn't to your standards or didn't meet what you thought, then it should have been took back and revisited and redone to meet those standards that you thought would meet the standards of this county. We would not be standing here today trying to figure out what we need for an ordinance. We're going from 1,200 to 15. And as mentioned tonight, we want to go to 2,000. What's next? You can't keep zoning this county with ordinances. We have got to take the step and move forward and set zoning in place in this county. I heard all the arguments about land rights and all, but yet we have people I have don't have no problems with you telling me what I can and can't do and how far I got to step back from my own land to use my own land. You know, what's the difference? I, I don't quite understand the difference. We can control where these industries go by putting in zoning where you or allow these type of industries, these type of businesses, these types of uh, residential developments. You know, we can do that uh, through zoning. I don't understand why is it that uh, residential can go and build up within 10 foot of their property line, but yet you want to tell an industry they got to set back 1,500 or 2,000 foot. Uh, you have a farm operating, you got my land line right here, and my property line, and uh, big development, their property line, they're 10 foot off the line, and they want to fuss at me because I got a chicken house sitting right there beside them. You should have put your chicken houses 1,500, 2,000 foot. I know we're exempt, but I know in time, somebody's going to try to question that, and somebody's going to try to fight it, and I know y'all all right here will stand up for that. But I would like to challenge y'all tonight to put this zoning back on the table that each one of you have expressed to me, you know, which this is what we need. We're the only county in the middle of this state that doesn't have zoning. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it why we can't try and control or not control, whatever you want to call it, where things goes. We have let this go for so long that we've interchanged everything. We got businesses inside industries, we got industries inside businesses, we got residential right next to, you know, uh, businesses. You commissioners went on here, uh, but right down here on 54 with the galvanized plant in, in the industrial site. All the folks come in here fussing about that. Nothing you can do. Not nothing you can do because we don't have zoning. Where I had property over in Lakeview, trucking company moved in over there, opened up truck company in the middle of about 14 houses. And every morning these folks have got to listen to this, these trucks crank up and leave every morning and their kids standing out there waiting on the school bus and then all these trucks come running by. So, commissioners, I'll give them my plea tonight. You know, I, I don't see the purpose in changing this because if 
an industry wants to come in here, it don't make no difference whether it's 2000 or 1500 They'll buy enough land that they can do it. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other speakers? Please. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Ruth Rogers, and I live in Snow Camp. I live on 212 Sylvan School Road. And a lot of what I had planned to say has already been said. And it's basically about our new neighbor, Alamance Aggregates, the noise ordinance that is not being enforced, the uh, fact that they do not have a county operating permit, the fact, just so many things that they are not complying with. And so this is the puzzles everyone in our community that we have a noise ordinance, but it's not being enforced. Everyone knows that. And we don't know why it's not being enforced. So the fear I have is um, if I lived in Saxopa Hall, I would live, and I live next to the landfill, I would know the landfill is being operated by the county. It has rules and regulations. It has operating hours. And then it's very it's stated on their website what the rules are. So I wouldn't be afraid of the landfill. I wouldn't be afraid of living there. I don't think people in Saxopa Hall are that concerned about it. But we live in Snow Camp, and we live next to a mine that is owned by Boggs Paving, Alamance Aggregates, that just flagrantly violate very simple county ordinance, a noise ordinance. It's so simple. No operating for a heavy industry outside the hours of 7 to 5, Monday through Friday. They operate all day on Saturday. And on their Google Maps um, page, they show, they even show that their operating hours are include 7 to 12 on Saturdays. So the question is why do they, are they allowed to do that? Why does the county let them do that? And why do they choose to be this kind of corporate citizen and just flagrantly violate what our county is trying to enforce. So what I'm afraid of is their 16-page document, which is their uh, permit from Deemler, which they received two years ago, has all these activities that are regulated. Wastewater <coughs> processing, storm rotter runoff, air quality and dust control, site work to protect against landslides, Tree clearing activities shall be avoided to protect maternal nesting of bat populations. Groundwater <coughs> monitoring. Yearly analytical reports by a qualified hydrogeologist of, I can't even pronounce that, <laughs> of groundwater levels and changes that occur in observation wells. Dewatering activities and the effect on neighboring wells. Seismographic records shall be kept of blasting operations. The limiting of air blast over pressure resulting from surface blasting measured in decibels. The reporting of incidences of fly rot pr beyond permitted and guarded areas. Restrictions on blasting distance to the colonial pipeline. Limits to ground vibration. Required seismographic monitoring locations and a notice of blasting to the colonial pipeline. The disposal of mining refuse and contaminants. The revegetation of permanently disturbed areas. Really? They're going to care about all these things if they can't even uh, if they can't even abide by a noise ordinance. So that's the fear I have, is that if they're just going to thumb their noses at a county noise ordinance, are they going to really protect our community and our environment like they're supposed to do? So that's the fear that I have. And um, I'm just asking the, the county commissioners to address the concerns of the residents of Snow Camp that we are literally being run over by a mining operation that is, is acting above the law. They don't care about the community. They don't, it, it's a very strange feeling that they actively do not care what they are doing to our community. If you could, they have hundreds of trucks every day going to the Toyota mega site. And there are about eight different ways you can drive from Snow Camp to the mega site north of Liberty. They take all those routes because if a hundred trucks went in one line, it would be very obvious, it would be, it would look very bad. So they have 
I mean, they might have four trucks at a time going each route. Every road in Snow Camp is being overcome with potholes, um, Greensboro Highway, Sylvan School Road, Timberlake, Richland Road. The trucks go down 49, they go through Liberty, they, they, they go down Old Dam Road. Anyone in Snow Camp will tell you that our roads are getting ruined because, and they don't care. So that's, that's my fear is that, number one, um, they are a, a county ordinance to protect us. The least the county could have done in the last few years was the noise ordinance. And that's not being enforced. And then um, they don't have an operating permit. So, and they don't care. Thank you. And we thank, thank you. you. Oh, are there any other speakers? I'm not trying to leave anybody out. I'm just making sure I, I don't miss anybody. All right, thank you. I think you can go to the 30 in a public hearing. Mm -hmm. Public speaking, but you can't go to the 30. Not the public hearing. All right, uh, apparently everybody's been heard from. Do we have a motion to close the public hearing? Motion to close. Second. We have motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. If the board will allow me, I'm going to just address a couple of the issues. One, traffic matters are not covered under the by the county commissioners. Uh, you can contact the highway patrol. Uh, you can contact DOT about the roads. That simply is not part of our job or, or jurisdiction. Um, so that that's one issue that... Um, what about the speed limit? Sorry, Brad. I'm, I'm sorry. We, we are, are not in a position to take questions. I'm trying to address some of the issues. Uh, secondly, planning goes before the planning board first and then they will make recommendations to us. We do not originate those changes at this level. They come from the planning department. Third, the rock quarry, I do know that legal has looked into that and they are taking appropriate action, but we have to follow very, very strict state and federal guidelines. And so we just can't shut an operation down without taking the appropriate uh, notifications and actions. And legal, do you have anything else to say as to that issue? You probably don't. Not at this time, no. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to address those issues before there are any other comments. Okay, board, we have two things before us primarily. Um, the first is do we amend the heavy industrial development section 6.5 to increase the class three land spacing requirement from the 1200 to the 1500? That would be issue number one. Issue number two would be the definition section 7.2 to include changes to the construction activities, operation and sawmill section under definitions. Those are the two things that we have before us. Do commissioners have any comments as to those two issues? I'd like to make a motion. Can I, I'd like to move that we table this request tonight and send it back to the planning board and have them bring us an explanation about the issues that have been raised here tonight, in particular the distance offset others and uh, the planning department to bring us some information and I'd like to see some of the questions get answered for our citizens. The number of questions raised tonight. Is that Just a comment or is that a motion? It's a motion. <laughs> okay. Um, this moving the number, the 12 to 15 and then I've heard 1,500 to 2,000. Right. Who thinks that feet is going to stop 
blast. Like, I wouldn't think 500 feet would make that blast. You know, I mean, hey, I'm just a girl. I'm just asking. (laughs) Ha, but I'm just thinking if um, that 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 amount of space, I'm I'm just saying, how is that going to fix it? I'm not I'm not saying anything about anything except the fact that I'm just going to be honest. We just seem to keep going in a circle here. This group, we, we come into office and here is all this. And we got a planning board and I watched the planning board argue with each other. And then some felt one way, some felt the other. And then they just squashed it. And I do believe the county paid for that a good amount of money to have these consultants figure all this out. And I don't know if it was a copy and paste from another county or if it was their own ideas from what they want to hear. I, one thing stuck with me that the meetings I was how tall your gazebo can go. Now that's just ridiculous. Um, but I'm just, we just seem to keep putting it off. <coughs> like we're going to put it back on them and then they're going to put it back on us. And these folks come here talking about this all the time. The one thing I'm hearing is this place is not abiding by the rules that they are supposed to be abiding. That's my issue because the quarry's not going anywhere. And, I, and I'm feeling that people have accepted that part of it. And part of their accepting it is, well, if we're going to accept this and we're going to learn to live with all this together, they need to follow their rules. Because I follow rules. And if they tell me I'm not supposed to be operating on Saturday, then they shouldn't be. If it's after 5, they shouldn't be. If they're, if they're working without a permit, shame on them. You don't do that. This is called do what you're told. And that's my issue with all this, because um, I don't think these were wanted neighbors. I can understand that totally, but you don't pick and choose where the rock is to start with. But at the same time, if you're I'm hearing compromise on different sides, but the one thing I'm not hearing compromise on is somebody's not following the rules. And this board needs to hold them to the fire to make sure they do that. If we can do that, do we that's, have the power to do that? Let's let Ms. Eisenberg uh, to address that issue because I know that the rock quarry issue is being addressed uh, and you have to follow the procedures. Would you please I mean, indicate what's going on? How many get out of jail free cards do people like this get? Because that's no, what it no, seems no. like. And I don't I say that facetiously, but it's just the same thing we're hearing all the time. Uh, well, first, I wanted to um, I'll address that, but I also wanted to mention there is a moratorium on um, Hido uh, activity that expires at the end of the month. If you all recall, you all extended the moratorium, and the purpose of extending it was to determine whether or not you were going to make any changes, which is one reason this particular ordinance was recommended to be heard at this particular meeting, was in order that way any changes that you're making are going to be made within you know the time period that you have for the moratorium. And, and um, we, you know, the planning director has, um, you know, we've been in communication with the uh, quarry owner. Uh, we've notified them of violations, and they are working on correcting it, and we're working with them. Does working on correcting it mean they stop, or they're working on it? They are, so the ordinance provides that um, if you are in violation, that there are certain enforcement measures that can mm-hmm. be taken place, and those are being followed. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to make, to make a suggestion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to second uh, Pam Thompson's comments, although it wasn't a motion. Mm-hmm. It uh, never is. <laughs> um, but uh, with regard to Mr. Um, Carter's motion, th- it seems that there are aspects of this ordinance that are not controversial, which is the definition section. Uh, I think we could move forward on that, have that in place uh, so that there's not an issue of I- any expiring before we address this. And then we, c- I think putting off the decision on the Class three land use spacing we could do that and save that for another for another meeting once and so it kind of takes care of both of those yes both of those issues I would suck if that's a motion I'll suck at that motion all right well so I would mr. Carter's motion has not had a second so let me just say that my motion would be uh, to adopt the definition the changes to the definition 7.2. in 7.2 uh, and that we and that we table a decision on the class 3 land spacing uh, 
measures so we get more information from uh, from the folks who presented today. Although I have made a second to that motion, I remind everybody, this went through planning over and over and over again. And planning looked at it from beginning to end and all the way through and decided not to send us any recommendations other than this. I don't want us to go through every single meeting discussing zoning. And that's where we're headed if we start tabling all this stuff and putting it out and put you know further and further and further. I will oppose that. I think it's that that ox has already been gored. And I do not think we need to revisit that at this time. Just one thing. I didn't hear anybody and I'm listening to all sides, I didn't hear anybody say they counted on the planning board. I didn't hear anybody say, when I elected the planning board, that's who I counted on. I heard they counted on us. We're new, Steve's been here for, going on four years, but we're new. It don't matter if we're new or been here 150 years, it's on us. And I think whoever, whichever side you're on of whichever issue is going on in this county, it stops here. And I, I don't want to feel like I am not living up to earning being on this position, even if it's a hard vote or a, a no-brainer. People count on us to do that. And I feel like we are just going in circles and maybe that's what we gotta go through to start with. But that planning board, I remember, I told Bill this, or he told me, who knows. <laughs> but I said, it's gonna be the hottest committee we have in the whole county because we are growing so fast and everybody wants to come here. We're having to build our school. I mean, everything is just like kaboom. And wrong choice of words, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> all things. I'm so sorry. Sorry. But um, I'm just saying, we got to always have balance in this, and the balance has to be second compared to our citizens because they live here and they pay for everything. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's really, we, we just got to um, get, get on this and decide what we're going to do and not be afraid to decide what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Well, and the, the reason for my motion was that we're, we're being told by legal that 2,000 feet is indefensible. I, I don't know that that's correct. Um, the planning director might have a better memory than, than I do because I know they, the planning board did discuss right <laughs> the different setbacks. I don't know about better memory, but a few things I do remember during these, what, gosh, it's been six months worth of discussion, it feels like, was that the question of what land spacing should be and what the number should be came to some discussion similar to what citizens have said here that what's the difference in 2000, 1500, why pick the 2000, why not the 1500? And it did come down to a discussion about what we already have going on locally, it's not in the county but in the city, of where there is a quarry and there's other developments around it. A lot of the types of developments that are on their list of the land spacing distance from a residence and hospital and things like that. So it came down to that and then the subcommittee kind of negotiated between themselves on what they could live with. It, we did have a person want 2,000. We wanted a person who wanted less than that. So they came to that negotiation at 1,500 through their discussions and then planning board back that. But we'll say it wasn't legal saying that it wasn't. All the the only thing we said is that if when you make these determinations you have to make sure there's a rational basis for the determination so as long as they have a rational basis for the determination it's appropriate and so what was the basis for 1500 feet I believe I mean I was in the room but I didn't make the decision the discussion came down to what was already existing how those types of existing uses were being impacted by an existing quarry and the numbers kind of moved from there on what made sense but I mean, we, we talked to uh, the schools and things around the existing quarry to see what impacts they were feeling. If, if the commis commissioners permit me, we did reach out to Professor Owens, who is retired, um, did, not res did not respond to our request for communication. Neither did Professor Lovelady. We reached out and asked to set up a meeting to discuss some of the citizen comments, and they did not respond. Folks, we only have two things in front of us, and we do have a motion and a second. 
If, any more? Can staff make one comment on that? If we're making motions, there's a consistency statement in your packet that by law we need to make sure that's part of any kind of motions for approval or denial. I'm sorry, say that again. There's a consistency statement in your packets that's required when we do these types of text amendments that it be part of those motions to keep us legal. <coughs> So I asked legal, we do we need to change uh, Mr. Attachment. Turner's motion? Yeah, oh. So the current motion is what exactly? I'm sorry. <laughs> Are we talking about page uh, 7.2? Yes. Page 31. I mean, I, I would amend the motion to to state that it, it is that we amend the definition section, the definition section 7.2 to include changes to construction activities, operations, and sawmill, and that we table the amendment to the heavy industrial development section 6.5 to increase the class 3 land spacing requirement amend the public hearing section and to add language for a land spacing variance until the next meeting and i issued the second to that motion okay. is there any issue with that motion and or second i think the planning director was stating that it had to be consistent was that what you said there's a consistency statement in the packet is all i think bill's found that there's already it's already in the packet yeah does that motion comply it's close yeah i read it verbatim yeah that's what i thought <laughs> exactly does that motion comply uh as, as long as it also includes the consistency statement that um, the planning director mentioned that's in the packet. So I think as long as it includes that. If you just mention that in your motion, I think that's good enough. I thought that was the consistency. And that we <laughs> abide by the consistency, consistency statement in the packet. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. But there's nothing about feet in this motion. Correct. Okay. And my second also applies to that amendment. Any other discussion? Uh, the only thing I wanted to add, since I haven't said anything here, is uh, I agree with what Pam said. Uh, and I agree with this lady here who, if if they're not abiding by the rules, it is, a, it is incumbent upon us to stick it to them, to make them abide by the rules. And maybe we, maybe we should get legal and get uh, the people who own that company and tell them that they're not being a good neighbor. And if they don't get their excrement together, they're going to be out on their butt. Simple as that. Now, I know that's simple to say, <laughs> very difficult to do, because we know lawyers. Okay. Mr. Sheriff, if you're going to now uh, oh, no. take out the DOT obligations and the highway patrol, how many more officers do you need? I will have officers down there writing tickets this week. <laughs> so now you're the gravel police. That is not our job. It's a highway patrol job. Exactly. So like these folks, I'm tired of this. Well, <laughs> it, 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 it is one of those things you get tired of because, like the lady said, you expect them to be a good neighbor and abide by the rules. And when they don't abide by the rules, they should know that they're not and they should be punished because that's what happens to most businesses when they don't fulfill their obligations. And uh, apparently, you know, maybe there's a, 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 a I'm going to say this in front of lawyers, uh, maybe it's a legal way and we can tell them, hey, look, if you don't get your stuff together, we're going to ask you to leave. Well, that goes to another whole other issue. Yes, sir. We ain't voting on that. Oh, no. Now, <laughs> so. I can understand Let's get back to the motion. I, I would be upset. <laughs> Greg's had to Does the ordinance have enough teeth in it? The, what we've been struggling with is the level of... I, I, I'm, I'm kind of feeling like there aren't enough canines yeah. in the ordinance. Because I know, uh, we hear stuff and we know what's going on from our people telling us what they're trying to do to get it fixed, but the ordinance, we're following the rules of the ordinances that we have in place. And to me, the ordinances don't have enough teeth. We need to take a look at enhancing the, our ability to enforce violations. Mm -hmm. yes. um, Five hundred dollars a day to some people doesn't mean anything. Oh, to them that's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, I'll pay you five hundred bucks a day for five hundred trucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I'm amazed. We've gone from we are so twenty-five trucks to hundred trucks, and now five hundred trucks <laughs> per day. <laughs> 
I think we need to go back to what's on the table yes. and vote on this motion. I think we've done one and two. You just need to ask if we're ready. Yeah, we're good. Mm -hmm. All right, is everyone ready for a vote? Sure. Thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make another motion. And I'd like to move that we have it, uh, direct our planning department to get with legal and look at the level of uh, um, enforcement capability we have in our ordinance and see what needs to be done to make it tighter. I think we can request that. That's what I but said. Planning has already beaten this horse to death. Yeah, that's what um, I said. And to tonight, you had what seven or eight people that were all wanting zoning, but how many more people? We had 26 that were opposing zoning at the previous yeah. meetings. That's quite a which, uh, which, which ordinance are you talking about? Ordinance. Which ordinance are you talking about? You're talking about the noise ordinance? He's now talking about the, uh, zoning. Uh, no, not it's about the noise ordinance. The, the hideout. Yeah. The, oh, the hideout. enforcement on the hideout. Uh, I mean, we, we $500 a day is just not cutting it. There should be a level at which it accelerates. Or, I'm not sure that's the height of ordinance. I think you're right, Mr. Turner. It's not the height. Yeah. Sounds like that's something that y'all need to discuss to go on the agenda for the next meeting, correct? With Deborah. The violation section is not specific to Hido, it's specific to the entire UDO. Exactly. Exactly. UDO, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. We thank you. And I do not want to continue beating a planning zone, a zoning course. Thank you. Okay, we're going to 8.1, uh, the annual audit. Good evening, Thank you. Commissioners. It is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight Elsa Watts, who is our audit manager, and she will be making our presentation. Okay. Thank you. This is your moment. Oh, I, I could probably make this presentation before I'm ready so many times. <laughs> Bruce has it. But we, um, we look really good, I'll tell you that. Good evening. On behalf of Martin Starnes and Associates, I'd like to present Alamance County's 2021 audited financial statements. Some audit highlights. The county received an unmodified opinion. This is a clean audit opinion. I'd like to thank Susan Evans, as well as Jennifer Blaylock and their staff for all their hard work on the audit this year. The finance department works directly with us throughout the year on the audit. Anytime we ask for information, it's given to us timely. It truly is a pleasure working with you guys and we hope to continue that working relationship. And then Susan Evans is the competent finance officer assigned to the, um, the audit. She is, has the skills, knowledge, and experience to oversee the audit services, which is a requirement of the Government Auditing Standards 2018 revision. Looking at your general fund, you had revenues totaling $182.6 million, an increase of about 5%. You had expenditures of $155.9 million, a decrease of about 2% and I will detail these further along in the presentation. Total fund balance for the general fund was $71.5 million, an increase of $14 million, or about 26%. This increase is due to revenues exceeding expenditures. Your available fund balance for the general fund, which is a calculation that the LGC uses to compare you to other units, um, you take your uh, $71.5 million total fund balance, less non-spendable items of 210,000, less items restricted by state statute of 11.9 million. This gives you an available fund balance calculation of 59.3 million. This is an increase in your available fund balance of just over 12 million. And this is an increase due to overall increases in fund balance. Available fund balance is a percent of expenditures for the general fund was 38.1%. And looking at your unassigned fund balance, you had unassigned fund balance of 35.7 million. You had total general fund expenditures of 155.9 million. And your unassigned as a percent of general fund expenditures was 22.94.
your top three revenues for the general fund included property taxes, which made up 56%. Local option sales taxes were 22%. Restricted intergovernmental revenues were 12%. And you had other revenues of 10%. Your property taxes were 101.9 million, an increase of 4%, which is overall very comparable. Local option sales taxes were 39.4 million, an increase of 22% due to increases in consumer spending. Restricted intergovernmental revenues, these are primarily your federal and state grants, were at 21.7 million. A decrease of about 2% there, but overall fairly comparable. Your total expenditures for the general fund, you had education at 32%, human services at 20%, public safety at 25%, and other expenditures were 23%. Education was at 49.8 million. This is a decrease of about 1%. Human services expenditures were 30.8 million, a change of less than 1%. Public safety was at 39 million, a decrease of about 4%. Looking at your landfill fund, you had operating income of 404,000. You had investment in capital assets of 8.9 million, an unrestricted net position of 12.2 million. Total net position was 21.1 million. The LGC looks at your quick ratio for the landfill fund. You had current assets of 26.9 million, current liabilities of 182,000, and this gives you a quick ratio of 147.1. The LGC would be concerned if this were less than one. And your performance indicator that the LGC is measuring is timely audit <coughs> submission by December 1st. Um, the county did not submit the audit to the LGC by the deadline this year due to the ARP, the American Rescue Plan major program. Um, there was a compliance supplement delay and that caused the delay in the audit. As I recall, you asked for the extension and got it. Yes, yes. I would think a lot of folks did the very same thing. The county must submit a letter to the LGC within 60 days of this audit presentation explaining the delay. And this concludes my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? I just think you said consumer spending went up. Is that the cost of what they're buying due to inflation? It, that could have an effect on it. Okay. My gas bill went up. <laughs> <laughs> my roast is a lot more expensive than it used to be. Thank you. Any other questions? The expenditures include all uh, sources, right? So ARPA funds, federal grants, everything. Is that right? For the general fund, uh, this was this presentation was mostly specific to the general fund. Just the general fund. Yes. Okay. So it does not include ARPA, et cetera. Correct. Okay. But if we've accepted a grant that increases the general fund, that would be included in there. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just one thing, because I'm going to get out of Bill. This is Bill's, this is Bill's moment right here, <laughs> uh, Mr. Smart. Um, education expenditures and human services expenditures, mm -hmm. why were they lower? So one reason that the education expenses went down is there was a reduction <coughs> in, that was requested by ACC through our capital plan for their capital. So we saw that decrease, but everything else remained the same. Okay, and human services. So human services, um, some of that was due to COVID. Gotcha. And not being able to per perform all of the... <coughs> gotcha. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? We no other comments. for you to just we do you. this. Oh I, my you, gosh, You're going you you to get me next month. Next month, <laughs> you're going to say, Bill, shut the hell up. How many meetings did he ask you to ready? I was so happy. Thank you.
tutorial. <laughs> Next well, commissioners, I do want to address um, that within your packet tonight, and you'll be asked to sign this letter that is required by the LGC, that it basically just states that due to the compliance issue, that's why our audit was late, and that we strive as a community and a county to have it submitted on time. Absolutely. Right. It was physically impossible to do so because of the uh, audit exactly. funds and, and whatever. Exactly. Sure. Thank and you. luckily the LGC was aware of that and they did work with us to make sure that we were able to get it in. So we appreciate their work. We appreciate you. Mm -hmm. The money you person is the rock. <laughs> <laughs> you got that big old check so. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you're up next again. I am up next again. So tonight we are asking the board to consider an, um, two, two options for us that would require two votes. Um, first of all, a couple of you remember a few meetings ago, we came before this board and said that we were going to put our audit services out for a request for proposal. Um, we have received four proposals back, and tonight the committee is making the request to award the contract for fiscal years 22, 23, and 24 to Martin Starnes and Associates. So that's the first quest, um, vote that we would also ask for. And then the second one would be to go ahead and award the fiscal year 21-22 audit contract. Um, Martin Starnes, their bid came in at $92,700, which is the same cost that we have for this fiscal year. Good to I'll make a motion to uh, bring the accounting firm Martin Starnes and Associates. Make a motion to accept their. Order. Yep. I'll second. Yeah, motion and a second to accept the audit. Any discussion? They're being done. All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. <coughs> Any opposed? It's unanimous. Okay. Your second issue is? Is for the awarding of the fiscal year 21-22 audit contract. And that is a standard contract that is issued by the LGC that we can't make any changes to. And I'll make that motion. Second. Your motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? They are none. Therefore, it's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. very much. Okay. So Mr. Hill is next, is that correct? Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, so tonight, conversation is a continuation of the presentation on Thursday, where during the, uh, the budget retreat, I suggested an immediate change um, in the hourly rate that we pay 19 of the 22 positions at the landfill. They are 18 if you, uh, hourly positions, if you will, and one supervisor. Um, during that conversation, um, there was a continuing conversation about if granted, when that raise would occur, whether that be April, May, or June payroll this year, or effective July 1st of the next fiscal year. The reasons for the request were twofold. One, to try to stop the hemorrhaging of losing employees. Uh, we've had about 100% turnover in the last year. And also to increase the salary to be able to attract their replacements. We have had three positions open now for some time. I believe we have one outstanding offer. We're waiting to get results back. And the other two, we simply don't have candidates for at this point. So one, need your input on whether you would grant such an increase, and number two, when it would be effective. Um, HR and budget, in a very timely manner on Thursday after our discussion, put together the cost estimates on what this would cost. It's approximately $8,000 a month. So if we were to do that effective immediately, that would be three months, $24,000. And then obviously next year, that same rate for the entire year. <laughs> Questions, comments? I think my comment was during our budget hearing, and for those in Yahoo land or whatever, <laughs> TV land, uh, 
we spent Wednesday and Thursday almost the entirety of both days going through uh, various departments, uh, the school system, ACC, all kinds of uh, regarding our budget. Um, and we did hear from Mr. Hill and Landfill. Uh, the very, very positive thing is that you are largely an income producer, whereas most of our departments are spending but not bringing income in, and that's very, very positive. But my, unfortunately, my comment was, I think Thursday or Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday. I think you made your presentation, yes. um, we we're right here in the middle of the budget, mm -hmm. and I'm going to encourage us, you know, every single department could come to us and ask for an immediate crisis mm -hmm. situation, and I'm going to encourage us to do this in the budget versus uh, each department every single meeting. Um, that's just the way I feel about it. I really apologize, and I clearly see the need. And that starts around July? July 1. How do you feel about that, Richard? Well, obviously, the quicker the action, the better we can combat the problem, but we certainly understand everything being a priority about budgets. So if it's the board's will to do July 1st, I think we send a very positive signal to our employees that we're making an effort to correct some problems. If that makes life easier on everybody, I'm, I'm for it. Absolutely. We thank you. Any other questions or anything? Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Ms. Morse. I think she's do, yeah. doing it by Zoom. Good evening. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm back before the board to give y'all an update on Friendship Adult Day. I came before you at your last meeting and made a request to the board to give us a one-time, um, I guess, advance on our services. Um, we have been like I said before, we've been in a, in a bit of a pickle because of COVID and the move and everything. Um, since our meeting, um, I believe I told you that the state was coming in that week to look over the facility, and they did. Um, during that meeting, because we are in a new facility, we had to go back basically to square one and give them all the information again to be certified as an adult day program. In doing so, some things were found that had been grandfathered in because of where we were in the old building that had to be changed now. We also found some things that um, had been apparently overlooked by the state and, and the county, DSS department, things that um, we should have been doing that we hadn't been doing. It wasn't anything to deal with safety or anything. A lot of it was the verbiage in some of our program manuals and things had changed over time, and we never updated those. Um, all these changes happened, um, I believe she said, in 2008, so that was before my time. So we, we were running unawares, and we were not, it wasn't caught by anybody until they started doing the new certification. So we are addressing all of that, we're getting all that fixed. The major thing that was a difference is that we now have to have a dietitian um, to sign off on all of our meals. We are part of CACFP, which is a child and family food program, and they are monitored and run, and all the requirements are set up by the USDA. So we have been running under those requirements. So we've been doing it right, but we haven't had anyone sign, having to sign off on it. So we started looking for a dietitian that could work for us, and we have just found one this morning. We put out bids to lots of different places. We put calls through to everyone we could think of, the, the county WIC program, anybody that might have a dietitian on board. Um, retirement communities, the school system, we talked to everybody. And we finally found somebody at one of the um, retirement communities that does some freelance and she's willing to come on board and sign off on that for us. So that's kind of the last piece. So we should be getting our certification in the next day or two and be able to open. 
That being said, um, at the last meeting we asked for $50,000 and Mrs. Cole was in the, in the room and she stood up and gave us a loan slash donation because we knew it was going to take a few more weeks to get us going and we needed something to bridge that time. Um, since then, we've had another couple from the Twin Lakes community give us an out and out donation of $10,000. Um, Ms. Coles is considered a loan if we get the money from the county and if we don't, then it's a donation. We talked about the risk there and she was happy to do that. So I went back to Sherry Hook and I had been talking back and forth about this and I went back to her and I sent her an email and told her that we didn't need 50 anymore, we only needed 40 because we've gotten the extra $10,000 from somewhere else. So we are still in need of that money in order to be able to open up and operate until we get reimbursed for what we did. Um, we are a month in arrears for everything we did. Um, we, well, actually, almost two months for some of it. We start, we do things for the whole month, and then we turn that paperwork in at the beginning of the next month, and we get reimbursed for that um, at that time. Um, so we were able to catch up the, we said we were about $3,500 in the hole already. Um, we needed another um, $22,500 each month to, to run our business. So that's, that's where we stand right now. We've got 18 people that are currently participants there that will be coming back next week when we open. We have 21 people on a waiting list right now. Every one of those people is elderly or disabled and needs this service that we provide for the county. Um, and if you add in their caregivers, we're talking about maybe 107, 120 um, citizens. Um, so we're, we're still in need of that $40,000 from the county. If there's some way y'all could see fit to, to give that to us, it's a one-time ask. Um, I just, I feel really sad that we may have to close and not open in the building that we brought to the town. I had a call today from someone who's helping Sherry, I believe, um, with the grand opening for the building. And we won't be there if we can't get the funds to do what we need to do to get opened up next week. So I'm just back here asking if there's something we talked about doing a contract with us once we were open and we understood that, you know, y'all are going to be looking at a contract over this time. I'm, I'm not sure if that's what happened or not. I haven't heard much back from anyone other than I know that this is not something y'all want to set up where everybody just comes and asks for money. We get that. But we've been in this community for over 40 years and we serve a purpose here. The people that use our services need them dearly in order to be able to work in this community and know that their loved ones are safe. So we're back asking for not 50 this time, but 40. What you got? I want to know. This is huge. I want to know how we're going to help this agency. So the way that we could help this agency would be that we would enter into an agreement that they are providing services on behalf of the county. And that's what I talked about last time was when I say contract, it's yeah. an agreement that they are providing right. services on, the, on behalf of the county. However, we would not be able to do that if they were not open. So with it's, it's that catch 22 of we could put a contract together, have it ready for when they open, but we can't advance them money and we can't, I mean, we could do the contract in, in anticipation of them opening, but if they did not, we could not follow through on the contract. So as county government, we can't make a just a donation to them. There has to be some kind of agreement in place that they are doing something on behalf of the county. Unfortunately, preparing to open is not going to qualify for that service either. It's got to be the actual service. Okay. And so that's what we understood, was that something would be put into place but would not be acted on until we open. And we're fine with that because we got that extra $10,000 bump and we can 
get a few things together and get it open and get it running next week once we have that piece of paper in our hand from the state. Um, and it looks like that, that was the last piece of what we did today. You indicated you were spending $2,500, $2,500 per week. Is that correct? No, sir. It was $22,500 per month. $22,500 a month is what it costs for us to operate. And in addition to that, we were already $3,500 in the hole, basically. I wasn't cashing my paychecks for three months. When you say, what did you just say, like, on behalf of the county? What did you, okay. Like, when we put up a half million dollars to the grant for um, broadband out in the southern part of the county, we're talking about doing that. That's on behalf of the county because mm -hmm. I was on the school board and it was a hot mess. With people not having, trust me, it was something. Hot spots, that's the big word. Uh, green level, we were doing something, wasn't it half a million dollars, Craig, for sewer and water or something for the public safety training center. So so those are different because they're not services. I don't, not no, I don't care, they're yeah. different to me. They're <laughs> those are not services, so what we're talking about are services. So well, I providing know, but a service on behalf of the county. I understand that. The detention officers that have been short, that put the detention in jeopardy, and we've had officers be attacked, because mm -hmm. that's one area you don't run short staff. You can get away with that, with having a drive through at Burger King and not having the dining room open, but you cannot have short staff. The inmates know that and they, they trust me, somebody can get killed, hurt really bad. Um, EMS, buses parked, you know, 911, hold on please, we got stuff to do. We don't have a driver. We, we don't do that. We always man up and do everything we're supposed to by our council. And Sherry, I'm not fussing you because I know, I, I was gonna honey, say, honey, this not is not you. With you. <laughs> no, I'm just make, trying to make a statement that everybody, that these people I just talked about in these certain things are serving the people in this county. These are the seniors in our county and <laughs> the building was built for them by Mr. Petrie. Come on, this is, mm. And then this 3.8 million that we got back because they replaced it, COVID, the mysteries of the almighty COVID money. We can do what you want to with that 3.8 million, but we can't work out $40,000 for these pay This is not right, if anything. And we have got to, it's kind of like what we just got through talking about with not, not operating your hours and not doing right in the quarry because you're supposed to follow the rules. Um, Friendship Day is always follow the rules. We can't help it. Raleigh gets her panties in a wad and said, oh, you're not doing it right because you hadn't done it since 08 and nobody told you. I mean, it's always something. And I appreciate the something people hold people accountable because we have to be careful. But um, this Can is I ask not Sherry right. a question? Not Sherry, did, didn't we talk about two other agencies in the community that offer services that contracted with y'all to get additional funding? We did, and those those agencies were in operation at the time and continue to be in operation. So that that's the difference. And I'm not trying to keep Friendship oh, Adult Day from getting funding. I'm trying to have us do it in the right way. Yeah, and I don't, we don't want the funding until we open. We've never asked for it until we open. Okay. How about John is standing there with a giant pair of scissors, <laughs> and as soon as he cuts that ribbon, you hand her that check. That's open, they're in business. There is a way to do this. They do it in DC all the time. And it's, no, it's not no, so right. Go I'm going there. <laughs> I'm going there, because somebody yeah. needs to go there. But I'm just saying, my, my county is way too good and honorable with integrity of what kind of leadership and, and all across the whole county to drop the ball on our seniors that take the burden off of caregivers eight hours a day. We saw what kids being home with remote, how parents had to go, oh my God, what do I do with my kids for eight hours? I work full time. I had no idea what they're doing. It's, it's change, it matters. We've got to adjust this, but we gotta, you need to go trade some stock and get about 40,000 in 15 minutes and make a donation, because I know you could do it. But, but what we were asking was that the contract be written and that the day we open, we will sign that contract. I mean, we're going to open next week. I mean, that's what it looks like right now. Now, I can't promise you that, but the contract doesn't have to be signed until we actually open. But 
having it ready was the issue that we needed because I can't go out and hire the other person I need to open if I don't know that's waiting in the wings. Yeah. So I mean, you're actually looking can't. at 30000 because you have a 10000 that's a direct um, I have contribution. Given 10, back. You have 10000 that's a loan slash gift if the county doesn't give it to you was, I thought, what you said. That, that is. It was a loan to us to pay them back if the county gave us the money. If the county doesn't give us the money, then she would consider it a donation. And that's what we've been operating on for the last few weeks. So at least 30000 No. <laughs> Pay back the 10. I have to give back the 10. It's if you give me the money, I have to give back the 10. Initially, initially it's a loan. Initially it's a loan. It's I believe we have a round around it, but it doesn't make sense a lot of times when you're looking at it. But if you start off with 50 and you take 10 away, okay, that leaves $40,000. We'll just talk. And then out of that 40, I've already used 10 to do buy stuff. And then out of the 40, I'll get the 10 back to her. So. May I ask you to speak? Uh, do I understand this facility will have to close if we don't come up with some money? Exactly. We, are, we aren't requiring them to do that. That's their choice. No, we won't have any money to be open. It's not a choice that we make. It's, it's exactly what it is. If we don't have the money to pay our staff to open up, I, can't, I don't want to open up on Monday and close down in three weeks because we ran out of money. That's the problem that we're running into because of the time frame. Let me ask you this question. Sure. You had funds and you did not cut back on staff. You did not cut back on hours. From your other presentation, you continued to pay full salaries. Uh, no, we only had table, four. And you were not We did cut back. We had two people that were let go, two people left. We were told by the county that we would be moving at the end of September 1st of October. So we kept our staff, the four staff that were left, we kept them on to go through 40 years worth of stuff in our building and get it packed up and ready to move. All right, when everybody else cut back because of COVID, no, how we did much the money, first year, we didn't have anybody money did there. you spend? What's the amount no. of money? No, the first year we didn't have anybody there. They all left in March. I was the only person that stayed and I went after the protection, the paycheck protection plan money to pay my salary. And then the state decided to do waivers, and they gave us some money for that. I think you're right. I think you're and then when we brought our staff back, we paid them for that. We opened back up, and then we had to close again. So that's Ellen when we County had, manager, do we does she need to come back before us after she opens and ask for monies? So, so we can do that, or we could put a tentative plan together based on when she may open and I think I I think I had mentioned that when I was mm -hmm. speaking earlier that saying. we could do that uh -huh. I just can't execute until I know for sure when she's going to open so I can't give her fund we can't do funding ahead of time to no. help her prepare for opening but if we as soon as we found a, a firm opening date we've got the contract sitting that needs to go through legal um, and Connie needs to review it but it's ready to go I just don't but she's indicated that she cannot guarantee even next week. She hopes right. next week. Exactly. No, sir. No, sir. We, we, because I'm not the state of North Carolina, they can tell me one thing today and change their mind tomorrow. I'm sorry, but I can't guarantee it's going to be next week. But I do know that we've done everything they've asked us to do and that this was the last piece of it. This getting a dietitian signed and on board to sign off on our menu plans that the federal government already signs off but won't back up. We didn't know anything about that when I came to y'all the last time. Connie, that came up in the meeting. Connie, but, does the state of North Carolina know the dire straits you're in? Yes, they do. do who does Bill Lashley wanna, need but, to let call? Me, let me <laughs> exactly. Who do I need yeah, to call? you can't like the hand that feeds you, Pam, okay? That's true. Um, I have to be nice and I have to talk to them. But but they are they are restricted and we want to do it right believe me we want to do it right and if had, had we known ahead of time we could have done some more work ahead of time but we didn't know until we knew now the united and way we, and, and other agencies have, have already turned you down is that correct excuse me the united way and other agencies that you know they sent me to you they didn't turn me down <laughs> okay <laughs> united way is a bank united way is not 
No, sir. <laughs> We are where we are right now, and we need to make a decision as far as what we have intent to do. I'm going to make a motion we table this until the, our next meeting. Well, that's not going to do anything at all. That's not going to help me. I'm sorry. Um, Ms. Hooks, mm -hmm. didn't you send us a program or an option in an email that said this could work if we prepare a contract that can't be executed until the day they open mm -hmm. and that's what she's asking for that's all she doesn't want the money until the day they open in the location so in I'm the building a, that was built for them in the building that was built for them so i'm going to make a motion that we approve extending a contract at the point in time in which they actually have an operation up and running to provide an operating agreement from the county and provide the necessary funding at 40000 I believe it is. The yes, 10000 has to be used to pay back Ms. the lady Cole. who made the loan, the 30000 to bridge the gap in the operations. Because Ms. Cole saved them. That's right. Yes, she did. And, and can I also add that um, in that memo that I sent to you, I talked about where that funding would come from. Correct. So um, it should it either needs to come from general fund or the um, revenue replacement in the ARP dollars. I'll amend my motion to include revenue replacement fund from ARP dollars. Thank y'all. That works. This is working. This is that, doing it. It was really simple, folks. <laughs> Way to go, Connie. Way to fight for your agency and all your folks you serve. That's what you Any other there. discussion? I fight with those people. Is there a second? Every day. That's right. right. I think Pam did. Didn't what? You, didn't you second this? Pro yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought she did. <laughs> I did. Yeah, she second. I really thought she I did. I did. I thanked you. That was the same as a second. <laughs> I have a couple of comments, Mr. Chairman. I mean, you, you guys do noble work, um, and, and I apologize you for that, and I apologize you for, for supporting your nonprofit and asking for this. I, I have a couple of problems with it. The first is I, I'm not confident that $40,000 solves the problem long term, um, but bigger than that is I, I think this is sort of the county is now in a position of sort of being a guarantor for a, a nonprofit in stress, in financial stress. And I don't know where you draw the line. If if we grant this, I don't know where you draw the line for subsequent nonprofits who who are in similar stress who come to the county and want money. I, I couldn't draw that line, and so I just I'm not sure that it's the proper function of county government to, to serve as a guarantor under these circumstances. So I, regrettably, I, I'm not going to support that. And we have we have a contract currently with them, do we? We've not had a contract with them before. No, so yeah. we're talking about extending the contract. There's no contract to extend. We've never had a contract with them. Well, this is talking about implementing one. Yeah. Well, that's different than extending. That's, well, extending is offering a contract, John. Right, okay. Extending the hand. It's terminology, my friend, okay? <laughs> terminology. Well, we're lawyers. So. <laughs> Can I speak to what you just said for a second? I'm sorry, what's your name again? Craig Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner. Hi. Um, I, don't, I don't think this is about our organization needing this, this bailout because of a pandemic and moving delays and all of that, things that don't normally happen in our real world. Um, the last two years have been extremely abnormal for everyone, I think. But what this is for is for those citizens of this county that use our services. That's what we're here for. I'm not here for my job or any of my staff's jobs or anything. That would be sad, but that, you know, we'll live. What won't happen is all these people who depend on us every day to do this. And we've been very good stewards of our money. We've had very good results. We have never come to the county and asked them for anything. We pay our bills on time. This is a, this is this is a situation that came up that a lot of it was out of our control, and it's just you know it, it's it's the way it is right now. This is not something, and I understand that you went to a couple other other places too, and I understand not wanting to set a precedence of saving people 
Um, but I think these last two years have been something extraordinary, not ordinary. And we would not be in this shape had this not happened. We were never in this shape before. Um, so I just, I just think that this is about those people that we serve more than our agency per se. You well, indicated 18 people that you're serving. Right now, and I've got 21, 21 people on a waiting list wanting to come in. So that's 39 people that we served in the building already. We're ready to serve. But you're serving their caregivers as well, mm -hmm. because half of what we do is for those people that come in there every day and have a good time, and they're safe, and they get good nutrition, and they get hydration, and they get their medicines on time. The other half of what we do is for those caregivers that are at home taking care of all their own business, working in this community. Um, that's the service that we offer. And there's at least two, sometimes three and four caregivers caring for one person. And many of you sitting in this room have either done it or will do it. It's not an easy job. Mr. Milk. I can't pronounce could, could you hear that? No. Oh, uh, Miss Cole isn't here. Uh, would another 10000 help? $10,000 would help, but it wouldn't get us under the pump. That's why we did a very... We did a budget analysis of exactly what it would cost for us to be able to operate until we start getting reimbursed again, based on when we thought we were going to open, and we didn't. So the money that we got, the $10,000 that was actually a donation, helped get us through that piece of it. And it, we've got that money now left, Mrs. Cole's money still sitting there, to get us opened up. But what I can't do is open up and then close again, because I can't pay my staff and I can't buy the food to feed the people, and we can't pay our bills. Do you have something to tell us? Yeah, so um, our team over here is um, reminding me that we cannot we cannot use ARP funds to pay back the loan. Okay. So the ARP funds could be for operating, but it could not be for paying back the loan. So we just need to keep that in mind. Can that come out of general fund? That could come out of general fund, or if someone else was making a donation, that donation could cover the loan. Just one thing to think about. The seniors in this county took the biggest hit when it comes to death for COVID. And a lot of people she's probably had in the past are no longer with her. Trust me, I know several that have lost their life. It just hit them like a train. And for these folks to be able to go somewhere and spend the day and feel safe, because um, COVID's out of here one way or the other. Tony, don't look at me. And um, I just want, I just, it, I don't want uh, people outside my county having to donate money to an agency that a building was built for, for this specific population and could shut their doors for them while the supervised visitation and the open clinic are free to open. Because they're supposed to be for Alamance County. And um, and I know that's heartstrings, but it's it's our it's our citizens. I mean, the the seniors have paved the way for so much in this county, for all of us to be sitting here. And uh, I just I just want us to do whatever we can to make this happen because this is something that we need to do because we're leaders and we have to think about our citizens legally, no matter what. So. Pam, I'll, I'll modify my motion to ten thousand from general fund, thirty thousand from ARC funds, so that we're not in violation of the ARC fund agreement. And uh, will you second that, Pam? Absolutely. I want to say that a couple of months ago, at the urging of all five of us, we heard from roughly, what, 29 nonprofits? Yeah. They all had immediate needs. Absolutely. They had needs that were urgent and needed money right then and we have not given those 29 any monies. How do we pick one single nonprofit that we've never had a contract with in the entirety of Alamance County and pick them out and just all of a sudden start giving money out? I don't understand it. What are you gonna to say to those other 29? 
I'll say to you what I said to you last week at the budget hearing meetings. We've had months that we've done nothing about all those people that lined up and sit at that courthouse to talk about when they needed money because they have to live on to get a dime out of a nickel budget anyway. Donations, fundraisers, that's how they live. I work for two nonprofits and it's just really tough. And we're looking at multi million dollar projects that we're going to do and we hadn't thought about them at that time. So please don't throw that up into this. And I totally understand what you're saying and I respect it in every way. But we've set on not making a decision for all of those requests. We've done nothing. So we need to either, that get off the pot thing, we need to do that. I didn't say the other word. But um, we need to start doing things when we have these meetings and these people line up and tell us the difference they're making, what they are making, and how important what they do is. And we just move on to the next thing. If we're not going to do it, we need to say we're not. But if we are and we're thinking about it, we need to make a motion toward that, not a motion second, that kind of thing, but movement. So it, it's, a, it's a hit or miss, John, because depending on one person, they may be about to fold. Somebody else may be really doing well. That's what matters to me is they're all doing well because if they serve the very front lines of dysfunction and everything else and just horror and violence in this county, Family Justice Center, we're going to probably end up taking on them too because being the Governor's Crime Commission, that's going, to be, that's going to be bleak, I'll just tell you. So I just encourage us all to look at this personally and hear their story and base our decisions based on that, not just lined up and A gets this, B gets this. We need to really listen to people and base that on what we decide. If you look in your art money, we got 32 million, part of it we've already spent because we had to. Uh, and the county itself needed 50 some million dollars worth of uh, changes. So who do you shore? The county citizens and not pay the county needs? Or the nonprofits? Uh, somebody's not gonna get money. And right. we have to make the hard decision, and I don't think they are in operation. They kept paying salaries and so forth when everybody else, my business included, had to cut back during COVID. Um, I, I, I just don't get, I, I'm not going to vote for something I feel is illegal. Well, let's just, we'll just vote. Call the question. We'll decide it. We'll just vote. Call the question. Yeah. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. no. Did you say, what did you say? No. We had three no's and two yeses. And the only reason I voted no is I don't see a clear path legally to I give agree. her money. Uh, maybe, maybe we can do this next meeting. I mean, if she gets open, uh, I I'm just to ask. Tell me if I'm wrong. If she opens, that changes the ball game. Correct? It changes everything. Ms. Morse, is, uh, do you have enough funds on hand to open to get yes. what you need? Okay, well, I think that that... But, but what, what I'm concerned about, sir, is I can open, but I can't stay open. And it would it would kill these people to come back for two weeks and then be sent home. Well, I'm curious why... For uh, three weeks. I'm just telling you, well, I don't I, want the money until I open. I just want to know that we could get it. That was my motion in the first place. They wouldn't get the money until we had a contract and they opened the bill. Okay, let's move on to veterans community. Wow. Good evening, commissioners. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Tammy Crawford, Director of Veterans Services. And I'm really excited tonight because I'm here to talk about the Veteran Community Project. We have an opportunity here in Alamance County to help our struggling veterans. I was, um, Bruce, can we bring yep. it up on the screen? I was um, hoping to share with you um, the Veteran Community Project on the screen so you could see it in action. It's a real Veteran Community Project. In August, um, I was able to go in person to see this amazing community. Seeing how the community comes together to serve the veterans was one of the greatest accomplishments I've ever witnessed. At the Veterans Service Office, we average at least one veteran per week that's homeless or facing eviction. Recently, we had a 72-year-old with stage four emphysema on oxygen homeless veteran sleeping in his car. 
This took a service officer four days to get resources to pay for a few nights in a not-so-safe hotel. After finally getting a resource to assist, there were no possible affordable housing in this area. The vet ended up moving out of state, and I think this is very sad. We have no local resources for homelessness. If we had Veteran Community Project, our time could have been spent working on benefits for a disabled veteran instead of spinning our wheels being frustrated. This is just one story of many we encounter at the Veteran Service Office. Veteran Community Project not only serves homeless vets, the center provides wraparound services for vets such as employment, health benefits, social security benefits, money management, life skills, etc. As you know, if when you're discharged, the military takes care of all your business, so a lot of <coughs> veterans discharge not knowing how to live and function in normal capacity. Veteran Service Community is a proven nonprofit. They have been doing this since 2016. Veteran Community Project will not take away from any other nonprofit in the area. We are asking that Alamance County acknowledge this issue and help provide a solution to those that have protected our nation without hesitation. Um, and I apologize, I had three speakers lined up, but I think there was a little conflict with the um, public speaking, so there's gonna be a couple more. My first speaker is Sheriff Terry Johnson. I'm up here to speak. Uh, my father was in World War II. My brother was in the Vietnam War. And I look at our nation today and how we are funding the people crossing the border. Health, food, housing. And we're able to sit here today because of people like my father and my brother that fought in the war when Japan, you know, started the war, bombing some of the other countries, Hawaii uh, and stuff. And uh, black, white, short, tall, Democrat, Republican, Independent, when our nation called these men, they didn't look at those elements. They came and fought for our country, not even worrying about probably what they were going to face. Many never returned. I had some friends that never returned that I went to high school with. And yet, our government, I'm not speaking necessarily <coughs> of y'all, but our government is willing to give money to people that don't really belong in this country, but we can't look after our veterans. How many of y'all here are veterans? I want to see your hand. Thank God for you, what you've done. These are some of the men that were able to return. There's some of them that didn't return. They can't make it in society the way you and I can. My brother was one of those, uh, died fairly young. My dad died at 49. All, I think, because of what they went through in the war. I got a friend right now that his arms are not much bigger than that right there because of Agent Orange. My wife and I, every Friday night that we can get together, we go out, take them out to eat. <coughs> Thank God that he had the financial stability of his family business when he come back from Vietnam. On these streets, you can ride and you can look at the homeless, some of the homeless veterans right here in the city of Graham. I don't know what the total answer is, but I can tell you, I wish I was president of the United States for about 10 minutes. You could bet our veterans would have been taken care of before people crossing the border illegally. Don't get me wrong. I feel sorry for those people that are coming here for the right way, but we must look after our people first, and then what we have left, we can share with other people. You were a veteran. You could, I don't know uh, if you were in Vietnam or, or anywhere like that, but I can tell you, they didn't question why we had to go. They went. They went. 
and they went to fight for you, 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 and me. And guess what? We can be here tonight because of their loyalty and their sacrifices and their courage to stand up for that American flag right there. I'm going to have to join Tammy with asking if there's any way you can help do this. I'd greatly appreciate it because I think we owe it to those people. I think we owe it to the men and women that fought to give us what we got to do here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Corey Spore from Veteran Bridge Home Community Network Director, speak next. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Thank you, Jamie. Before I start, I do have some handouts that I'd like for you guys to see, mostly data. So real quick, my name is Corey Spore. I know some of you, some of you know me. I uh, joined the military when I was 18. Served in the United States Marine Corps. Obviously, my mother didn't want that to happen. She didn't want me to join it at all, but I told her if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it the best. So I went to go leave Marine Corps Infantry. After doing four tours overseas, what I decided to do was get out. Not sure what job I wanted, how to do it, how to transition. So I sat there and thought, how do I do it? How do I go about becoming a member of society again? Uh, so, luckily, through the Wounded Warrior Fellowship Program, I actually worked for Congressman Mark Walker, Veteran Outreach Coordinator. Don't worry, he wasn't a politician, just worked with veterans. So, after that, he decided not to run for re-election. What did I do? Decided to work for a nonprofit called Veterans Bridge Home. I'm currently the Community Network Director for the Triad. Transitioning is rough. Even today, it's rough for me. It's rough for veterans, and you can hear it, you can see it all the time. When you think about it, you go in the military, I went in at 18 years old. I didn't know another life. I knew military, I knew high school, that was it. So for my entire career, all I knew was being a Marine Corps infantryman. And then I leave and I'm expected to know how healthcare works. I had no idea how it worked. I didn't know what a premium was. I'm not sure if I even still do. But when that happens, it doesn't set you up for success. You're sitting there worrying, how do I provide for my family? How do I worry about what I need to worry about in the right way? So with that, being part of an organization like this nonprofit that I'm part of gave me that sense of belonging again, that sense of purpose. And that's what a lot of veterans lose when they leave that structure. Many of you have seen the military, have had family members, have served in the military. You would realize that structure when you were in, it, it goes away. Sometimes some people transition well, sometimes they don't. But with that, it is imperative that we make sure that veterans transition properly, and sometimes they don't. So with my job, we do basically indirect services. A veteran needs assistance, such as food, housing, they come to us and we connect them with the proper resources in the area. With that, Alamance County is a great county. Let me we slow are, you down. Who is us? Who Vet are you? And veterans you? Bridge Home is the organization I represent. Right. And where are they originated? Are they incorporated? Are they an LLC? It's a, non it's a nonprofit organization originated in Charlotte in 2010. All right, that's what I'm about. Recently, we expanded into this area. We cover four markets, the Triad, Fayetteville, then Triangle, and obviously our headquarters in Charlotte. Uh, so with me being the Triad Network Director, I cover 11 counties here that we consider our triad market. And what counties are those that you represent? So the biggest three are Alamance, Guilford, and Forsyth are the biggest three. Other ones include Davie, Caswell, Davidson, Rockingham, etc. Pretty much the central to northern locations. So with the organization we connect veterans with the proper resources in the proper amount of time. If you ever had to deal with the VA, it is not easy. It's not a direct path. It's not quick. You don't know where to go. You spend half your time on Google trying to figure out what services a veteran has. When I left the military, mm -hmm. I didn't think I could use the VA. I thought you had to do 20 years in order to use it. And finally, luckily with the VSOs, I said, Corey, you can get disability. You did four tours overseas, you're entitled to it. Most of those being to Afghanistan. So luckily, I finally found that, but after how long? So with these resources, there's always a need. There's always a gap in services. Currently, that is housing. That is one of the biggest needs. If you look at the handouts that I gave you, the, one of the biggest things, if not the biggest thing, is housing. Right now, this is from 2021, fiscal year 2021. We had 3,331 referrals for housing. Now, obviously, housing is a big spectrum. 
you have unemployment, which leads to homelessness, you have transitional, rapid rehousing, etc. So out of all of our 11,930 referrals, 25.4% of those were housing. And a big portion of that was from right here, the biggest three counties I serve. Alamance, which has 9,100 veterans, Forsyth and Guilford are ranging between 25,000 to 28,000 veterans. And it's coming from these counties. So a lot of times veterans have a bad stereotype. They get depicted in movies as drunks, drug addicts, become back homeless. We can't contribute to society. And it's reminded me of a good friend of mine, Jim Hoffman, who has his own nonprofit in the triad. He went to the movie, The American Sniper, about Chris Kyle. At the movie ended, as you guys know, obviously Chris Kyle was killed by another veteran. Jim Hoffman heard another non-veteran say, we gotta be careful, we gotta watch out for them. They can snap at any minute. Now, for me, as a combat veteran, I wouldn't say that was offensive, but to me, it's is that the way we're viewed? That I'm walking down the street and I automatically assume I'm gonna snap or car backfires I'm gonna jump under? Of course, some of our Vietnam vets, other combat vets, you might have that issue. But that isn't for everybody. So going through the, more of the data very quickly, the biggest need is housing. Other ones, such as employment, to me, those go hand in hand. It's hard to have employment without a place to stay. It's hard to have a place to stay if you don't have a job. So with the Veterans Community Project, them coming here allows them to, one, set up that veteran so he can have a stable or she have a stable platform. It's not just a tiny home where you build it, throw away the key, good luck. It's wraparound services, such as, do you have a job? If not, you work with guys like Doug Fricker here, who can assist with housing, can assist with employment. They need benefits. They go to Tammy and her staff. Getting VA disability benefits, I mean, that's crucial. You look at, if you're a 50, 60, 70, 80% rated, you're looking at anywhere from $1,100 up to $3,600. That money's gonna get pumped right back into the community. I live here in Burlington. I'm rated at 50% through the VA. So that means each month I get $1,100. Where am I going to spend that? Right back here in the county that I live in. So moving forward with it, big reason that I'm saying we need this isn't just because, hey, thank you for your service here, veterans, because there's a lack of resources. And the reason I do this job is veteran suicide. It's a, just a pandemic that happens. Everybody talks about COVID. These pandemics go away. So veteran suicide does not. I've had double digit friends that have taken their own lives. I'm sick of getting phone calls at midnight saying Sergeant Spore, somebody else just put a gun in their mouth. I don't know if you've ever gotten that phone call. It's not fun. But the amount of times I've done it, the amount of times I've heard it, unfortunately I've almost become numb to it because it happens so much. One of the main contributing factors to it is homelessness. And it may sound scripted, but I literally told other people on the way over here, I literally got a text message saying somebody was homeless with suicidal ideologies. And that's literally right here in our backyard, happening every day, day in and day out. So as local politicians, as local commissioners, I know sometimes I've worked in politics before, you're not always gonna have you know, the right answer, you're not gonna have a solution. But I have both and that's the Veterans Community Project. You will see the investment that it is. Don't think of it as something that's coming here just to set up shop. It is something that one, you can take these veterans, turn them into a great member of society, which they already are. They're not just gonna do great work, they're gonna thrive. I didn't know what I was gonna do when I got out. It sure was not go work with a politician. As a Marine Corps infantryman serving with a conservative Christian politician, the way I cross, that wasn't in the cards, but it happened. And that set up my tone for this work. So I'm asking you commissioners, please, think about the veterans, think about what they've done for you, for myself, and for the future generations. So I ask that please, at some point, we bring this veteran community project here and I promise you, you're gonna see a solid investment and you're gonna see these veterans that once would have been cast aside, thriving in society and running businesses. What's stopping you from coming here now? Say that again, please, sir. I'm not sure of what we as county commissioners can do to cause you to be here or not be here. I mean, you're a nonprofit. What, what are you asking us to what do? What are you asking for? I'm, what I'm asking for is that you guys vote and approve that the Veteran Community Project be allowed to set up shop in Alamance County. Do, do you what's need our approval? Yeah, what's the, the approval, what well, I'd like for it to be taken to a vote that we can, with the funding, there will be funding a cost for this. And I'm not the one that's been involved with all the conversations with the funding through VCP. I don't represent VCP. But I know with the job that I do on a daily basis, having a main resource is valuable. So I'm asking, that is this a good idea something that you as commissioners 
would like to see here is a veteran community project with tiny homes, wraparound services, so the veterans can get what they need in one spot. Let me slow you down there. We have Alco Vets LLC, which mm -hmm. is a nonprofit, Correct. Alamance County Veterans. I assume you guys work with them. Yes. I know they provide housing, they provide, I've seen uh, Bobby Chen, their vice chairman, write, take his own personal credit card and house on his card later to be reimbursed by Alcovets for, I know, a week or two weeks worth of uh, motel accommodations. So I assume that you and uh, veterans, the Veterans Association, I assume you're working with Alcovets now, is that correct? Yes, we work with different organizations in the area. Super. Can I speak to this for just a well, second? Let me, I want to know how much, what is he well, asking I'm, us to I'm do? I'm going to tell you what he's asking you to do because when they were here in January and they were here for two full days, you and Steve come in and met Justin and Vinny and but Ben. That group's out of Wait a minute. City. That's the group we're talking about. That's who does this yeah, yeah, My great. my organization is out of Charlotte. The organization we are talking about bringing here is out of Kansas City. But let me just add to it. Corey's group would be the anchor for all the services. And but when you guys, you and Steve, come in for about thirty minutes and met them. Craig wasn't able to come, you introduced who you were, and Bill was exposed to COVID. So for two days, we were all over this county meeting with Jay Baker at Allied Churches, the Chamber, the City of Burlington's planning, engineering, permitting, the City Lot. We met all over the place with all different folks, and you missed it. And the thing of it is, is this is an on-site in the service center nonprofit that wouldn't cost us. They defer everybody to get veterans hooked up. And just to get this clear, so if your people are hearing us, John, Alcovets is a wonderful organization. Absolutely. They are building cabins on land that was donated to them on Bass Mountain by That's Mr. Right. Chestnut, which I went up there to meet him with Chuck and his son. And that is a retreat. That's a three or four day place in the mountains on that That's mountain. Right. This is a home anywhere from 10 to 14 to 18 months. That is something that you get a retreat on and you go to get away. And I just pray that you're okay when you do go up on the mountain by yourself to get away. That's the most important thing. And there's supervision and there's counseling. There's all kind of stuff provided for them. But you keep going back to that. That is nothing at all like this. This is nothing at all like Alcovet. But they can be good partners. Whenever I heard, when I met with these guys back in August in Kansas City, I talked to Chuck Talley. I said, we can be good partners because you provide something, building ramps, helping with light bills, helping with a motel. Those are like Baptist men. Those are emergency <coughs> services. This is actual transitional housing to where a homeless vet has a pillow to sleep his head on at night for whatever amount of time he will need. You have a staff that will be in the service center that will help to get them to where they need to be, on-site counseling. It's like a mini hospital. It's not the VA, it's this. They're building their fifth site in Oklahoma City. I dare say these vets, the, the president is the former Secretary of State of Missouri. If, if all of us could have been at all these meetings together, you would really know how amazing they are because Jay was there, because if anybody knows homeless, it's Jay Baker with Allied Churches, and he's also a veteran. The room was filled with flipping royalty. I hate you missed it, but this is what this is. These folks are here to support the homeless vet, the guy that's got two purple hearts and missing a leg that's sleeping in his car, the guy that's in the woods in a tent that's sleeping, the girl that's having to go to other places to help get services. Not every veteran comes home from deployment the way they went in. I, my son was really lucky to come back and just be like he's supposed to. Well, I could say that on a day, day basis. But, um, and Craig, look at Craig, successful attorney. My Lord, he's the epitome of what successful that is. And, but not everybody can claim that. And this is, we got a lot of vets and I mean, I've, I've just gave the, Share pictures of two new two homeless sites that Eckerd's the, the Rite Aid drugstore and all this and then I just showed him a picture of a syringe a needle in the parking lot at the crossroads. Let me tell you about the guy sat beside on the pew in the courtroom last week in Superior Court about to fall out because he was just about overdosed. 
It's, it's all connected. But this is our military. These are homeless vets. And like the sheriff said, I'll never understand how we pick and choose one over the other. But this is the military because we need to pick them because none of us would be sitting in here if it weren't for the freedoms that we have in this country. You, you guys know I'm a, I'm a poster child for supporting this. I got this in August. I've talked about this at every meeting. Brian Haygood has told you about the money they would like to start up with art money if they could use that to build the site. They are not a county agency. They are a nonprofit. They will never need a dime from taxpayers. They will not be part of our budget. They are so supportive. So that's one you can put in your pipe and smoke it, as they say. <laughs> but um, I, I just, um, I've asked Ben and them, I said, would you guys come back here and present to the commissioners when they're here and you can have them all five at the same time and they said absolutely because you need to hear from them because you missed it and, and that's okay we all have schedules but um this is this this is like we wouldn't be just for Alamance County we'd be for the state of North Carolina because there's homeless vets all over this state and uh, we need to serve talking about being a rock star for our county our state they don't have anything like this and we need to think about something like this, just like we're thinking about other things that are supported as well. Sorry. I'm going to defend Mr. Carter and myself. We spent over three hours meeting with these folks. You did not. We spent over three hours meeting with these folks. We uh, had snacks with them, all kinds of things. We were not invited, I was not, to the two-day meeting that apparently you were You got uh, the email from Brian And Hager. you campaigned on, we're going to bring this group in and it will not cost the county a penny. No, That's what Jason's you told on. you how much it would cost because that was the first thing you asked him. You were sitting on the back. When you, and you campaign asked him. for this position of county commissioner. You campaign on it will not cost the. You were going to bring them here, yeah. and it will not count cost the county a penny. Okay, now like diversion with the di like diversion with art and and other things like that. We can say the very same thing. It will not cost the county. They will be part of the budget, but this won't be. And you just need to really separate Alcovets and this because they're both great, but they're not the same, and one doesn't threaten the other. I'm done. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to support your efforts, but I cannot give all of the art money to your cause. You don't even. And that's all I'm saying. Yeah, yes, sir. Absolutely. And, and with that, I'm. I'm it's not here not to them. talk logistics or money about it. I'm just, I work for Veterans Bridge Home, not VCP. I'm just here to share what I see on a daily basis. And that is being homelessness and housing issues are huge. And, you know, if I had the right answer, how to solve it, and every organization could be involved, then, you know, then I, I would do it already. I wish my job didn't exist, and I wish I wouldn't have to ask for an organization like this, because that means every veteran is taken care of. Uh, so with that, it is, it's just explaining what I see day to day, the countless veterans that need assistance, and just looking for other ways to help them here, specifically in the county. I don't want to have to send them to Guilford or Forsyth. If that's the case, then, of course, they need help. But if we can keep them in Alamance, that should be the priority. Mr. Chairman. Could I suggest we move to the third speaker? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Let me just say while, while we're on it that I really wanted to be at those meetings. My daughter broke her hand the night before. I know. So I was you are taking huge. care of that. You also uh, work in Guilford County. So I but, I would have, but I had planned to have been there and would have been I know, there. She had I know. But it just worked out that it just didn't work out. That's why I hope they could come back and speak to all of us in this form of a meeting. Ms. Crawford. The next speaker is Ken Sellers. He's the president of the Veterans Foundation of North Carolina, and he's uh, nationally works with the It's been well over two hours. Okay. Thank you, commissioners, for this opportunity to talk with you. And thank you. And by the way, we all support veterans. Mm -hmm. There's well, no I'm, question I'm glad, about that. I'm glad. We need the support. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to change my presentation because a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said a lot better than I could say it myself. So there are a couple points that I do need to make, though. Uh, first of all, I'm Ken Sellers. I live at 3853 Wesley Court in Twin Lakes here in Burlington. But I'm just one of over about 9,000 veterans who live in Alamance County. I'm also just one of 9,000 veterans who vote in Alamance County. Over the years, I've tried to do what I can to help veterans. 
and their families. In doing so, I've noticed that often veterans need more help than they know how to get. That's the issue. They need more help than they, do, than they, they know how to get. Because they don't know where to go to get help, or that they have trouble with or cannot deal with all the paperwork or the red tape, subsequently the need goes unmet and an already important issue becomes an even larger problem. But isn't that the VA's responsibility to cut through all the paperwork? Isn't that what, why they're here? The VA is not the answer to their problems. I'm, I'm telling you that there are veterans who don't know how to navigate the VA system. And because of that, they give up. And some of those may be the homeless veterans that we're talking about. Or they may have to suffer with illnesses that otherwise could have been treated. The Veterans Community Project, in addition to giving a temporary housing to homeless veterans, also provides a lot of wraparound services. You've heard that term used tonight. But that's the difference. The Veterans Community Project is more like a one-stop shop. The veteran can go there temporarily and find housing that is in the form of a tiny house. It's 240 square feet of living space, which includes a bed, a bathroom, a shower, a kitchen, a living room, and a desk, all packaged into an orderly studio apartment. And if you've been looking at the screens, you can see in some examples of the uh, Veterans Community Project villages. They're given bedding and towels, new bedding and towels, and those stay with the veteran even when they leave. They are given a secure environment and they learn during the time in the Veterans Community Village how to successfully integrate back into society. They're not only given a fully furnished tiny home to live in temporarily, but also a case manager and access to a litany of wraparound services, as I mentioned before, like counseling, dental care, veterinary services for pets, because veterans, because of their PTSD or other emotional issues, might need a pet, financial literacy instruction, and community building. As, uh, and aside on the f financial literacy, I'm on a committee with the state veterans of foreign wars. It's a relief committee. Our job is to review applications that we receive from veterans all over the state for funding for various reasons. When this was set up, we first had to come up with an application because we found that those who were asking for help weren't giving us all the information we needed. So we came up with an application uh, and then we had an opportunity to interview them each time. But we see with those applications, a lot of people are kind of stuck in a, um, in a circle. They're going around in circles. They want help in the form of finances to pay their monthly rent, their car payment or whatever for food but they don't have any idea at all how they can get out of that circumstance. And what I saw when I was first introduced to the Veterans Community Project was the help that they could provide long term to these veterans. They can get them out of that cycle that they've been in. There's no other agency or any kind of help for the veterans that does that currently. Because, as I said earlier, the veterans who need the help don't know where to go to get the help. Or they're so overwhelmed with the amount of paperwork that's needed for, for getting the help that they just give up. And that makes the problem even larger. As, as I uh, listen to the words, uh, I, I said to myself, 
Well, I'm not going to give my whole speech uh, because, like I said, people have said things a lot better than I can say them. And I would say this, if you're interested in hearing some veterans who have actually lived in a veterans community village, go to their website, Veterans Community Project. And on that website and a couple other websites that will probably you'll you'll probably be directed to, you'll see interviews with veterans who have lived or are living in the veterans community village. And they talk about how the fact that they have a secure place to live, a clean place to live, and they get the other kinds of help that they need, how they are beginning to regain a, a sense of dignity and worth and they feel that they can contribute to the better betterment of the community so you know those are kinds of intangible things that that you um, you want to know about and you don't know exactly maybe how they they come about but it comes about over time the veterans are housed together they have an opportunity to speak with other veterans who have similar problems like they have they have that secure environment, as I said before, and they have people who will help them find a job. They're provided with food while they live there. And all the other services that, that go along with that. So it, it's, it's a great opportunity. One veteran in the interview that I looked at made this statement. He said, first of all, veterans' issues are not political issues. They're American issues. And that's the way they should be treated. We're all Americans and we all should be concerned about how our veterans are treated. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I served in the Navy as a medical corpsman with the Marines in Vietnam. Before I went to Vietnam, I worked in naval hospitals in Philadelphia and Great Lakes. And I was trained to take care of surgical patients and psychiatric patients. Now this is before I went to Vietnam. Can you imagine what I saw working on those kinds of wards? I saw amputees like you wouldn't believe coming back from Vietnam. I saw multiple quadriplegics, multiple amputees and quadriplegics who came back. One person that you might know a little bit of if I mention the name is Lewis Puller Jr., the son of Chesty Puller, the most decorated Marine. Two of us corpsmen were trained to take care of him. He came back because he stepped on a landmine in Vietnam, missing both his legs, one at the hip, and parts of fingers in both hands. His wife, he was young, he was in his 20s, his wife was expecting their first child at that time. He not only was physically in bad shape, he also was mentally in bad shape. Now, do you think a person like that can go to the VA and get the help they need? They're not able to. They're not physically able to. They're not, they don't have the mindset right then because they're dealing with so many other issues that are a priority for them above anything else in their life. So what I would ask is that you support the Veterans Community Project. Bring it to Alamance County because it's a game changer. It's a game changer for veterans. And only you all can get on board and make this happen. So I ask you to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Jay Baker from Allied Churches, he's the director there, will speak.
Good evening, Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for my time and space. I'm going to make this kind of brief. Uh, but I want to approach this from a different standpoint. Uh, I'm a veteran. I actually enlisted in the military, completed basic training, and was sent to Desert Storm. I was probably one of the youngest people <laughs> ever to have a combat ribbon and an overseas ribbon all at the same time. A lot of the focus about veteran service is those that are wounded, those who are amputees. There's no wounded. There's no amputees here. What we're talking about here is providing places for veterans to live. When we're talking about support, we're not talking about case management. We're not asking. We're asking for support from the county to create permanency for veterans who can't do it on their own. We're talking a group of people who have a specialized skill set that many people don't have. Craig has skills that I don't obtain. I have some kid skills that Craig probably didn't obtain. <laughs> My skills led me to work for the Federal Bureau of Prisons for 46 years. You know how I was able to do that? Because I went through the military. And what I learned kind of kept me going in that direction. But what services and wraparound services can't provide is housing. What veteran, Veterans of Office Administration cannot provide housing. Alcovets cannot provide housing. They can provide access and short-term funds. But what we're talking about here is a cloud of land somewhere <laughs> where veterans have a place to stay have a place to heal and have a place for people who have like minds and like interests to really work on people with like mind and like interests. One of the things I can tell you about veterans is it's very hard when you talk to people that have not served. They don't speak our language. Social cues are hard enough just living. Think about social cues from Craig. Think about social cues from Jay. If we're in that battle and we're in that mindset what this is is an opportunity to put veterans with veterans. This is an opportunity for those men with specialized skill sets to work with those men who have displayed those specialized skill sets. It really found permanency for them to live. Um, I am the veterans rep for homelessness for the region. Um, I've been doing that since 2015. That's something that had never happened that I knew of prior to me moving to North Carolina in 2015. But that is a position I stepped into based off of what I knew and the experiences that I had. Uh, we service about 25 to 30 veterans a year at Allied Churches. Their length of stay there is less than 24 days. Has nothing, no impact on the 2,000, 9,000 veterans that we talk about that are in Alamance County. That's just less than 1%. But it is important that we take care of those people who took care of us. This is just an opportunity to provide a platform for people to take that, that, that chance. Um, it is important to me, um, very important, that we, we give them that opportunity. Uh, so we are asking, or, we, or I am in support of the Veterans Project. Um, and whatever support the commissioners can provide and the county can provide, be it support, be it land, <clears throat> whatever that is, to get this project moving um, so that we can see some change in how we treat our vets in Alamance County. Um, they don't have a lot of solid services. And housing um, is such a tedious process, being that I am one who deals with it every day. <laughs> Housing, perception, the way you present all dictates if you're available for that housing. And if there's any attorneys in here, then they all know what I said. It's totally against federal law. <laughs> However, I work with it every day, and I know what happens. When you have to tell your clients and your recipients to dress a certain way to go fill out an application, it doesn't make a difference whether I look like Bill or anybody else. I should be able to fill out the application. Reasonably, if I have a 580 credit score, no evictions or convictions, 
and enough money, I should be able to move in. But it's all based off of what now? Perception. We have to give our veterans an opportunity to have a place to stay. And what better place to do it than in Alamance County? That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What was the amount of land that was needed for the space? The land is the corner on Vaughn and Graham Hopedale where Canodal's clinic used to be. It's uh, ideal for the QRT when we were out of Kansas City that's got public health, DSS, walk-in clinic, everything right there around it. Ms. Crawford. We come back to, I know that several of the uh, bus commissioners have talked about that Canodal Clinic site. Um, and my guess is we probably, probably would, I can't answer for the other four, would probably approve that. But I'm still not sure what you're asking for. Is it money? Is it land? What, what are you asking us to do? We're asking for that land i suppose the land that we they negotiated when bcp was here but also um they talked about a 6.5 million dollar money to build the building the there would be 20 homeless houses the homeless tiny houses 10 being single family homes two adl homes and eight family homes the 6.5 million would also cover the first two years of operating costs. Now, I do think that is the largest number. We have all kind of thrown around talking to some contractors here that may be donating some tiny homes, but to get us started, we would have to make a commitment to VCP for the monies. And then I think after that though, they will come here the nonprofit raises all the money from here on out after that first two years. They, they're huge. They're saying they'll take care of the fundraising. Also, the Chamber of Commerce said they would help with that. The, North, the state will come in and help with a lot of it, too, because this is not only going to serve Alamance County veterans, it's going to serve North Carolina veterans. There's nothing like this on the East Coast. VCP has five now, or they're, in, they're almost to five. They've got five uh, plots of land. They're going to open three more by the end of 23. Right, Pam? Yeah, this also includes this about a 25 to 30,000 square foot service center. Yes. It's just not for the homes. That's correct. The service center would be a wraparound service where any veteran can come. They don't have to be homeless. They could seek any kind of benefit they're looking for. There's case managers, there's doctors that come weekly, veterinarians, dentists. They, it's just, it's sort of like it's a, it's a home for homeless veterans that are making their way back in society. So basically, you're asking for the Canoe Clinic site and six point six point five million. Six point five million. When they came here and we met with them, they said it would all be nonprofit would not cost the county anything we just want you to to support us and basically favor us not the term they use um, but the money would come from private industry what happened to that i think jason sit right there and said it would be around eight well, that would be the total max and then when we had met with brian and um that team and us they had talked about that since Alamance County was doing, had so much art money, that that could be a way, because they've used that for private and art money in other states as well. But, you know, it's like I told you a while ago, I asked Ben if they would come back here and discuss this in depth with you guys in a meeting where we're all five here at the same time. I think that would benefit any questions that you might have, because uh, nobody can talk about Veterans Community Project like the guys who've started this. They have won national awards. They've, they've done it all. And I know when Craig told me when I was going out there last year, he said, well, if we're going to do this, let's do this right. And, um, and they do this right. They really do. They're breaking ground in Oklahoma City, Sioux Falls, um, in Denver, not Denver, but the other one in Colorado. 
and uh, St. Louis and Kansas City. So I would suggest if, if you're even considering listening that they come back here and present to you in person. Mr. Chairman, I have a question and a comment. Um, <coughs> Ms. Crawford, do we, do we know, what is the estimated number of homeless veterans in Alamance County? Do we know that number? I have that question too. 9,000. About 9,000. Uh, I think we do not know veterans. the estimated well, number of homeless veterans. veterans. There's yeah. really not no homeless. way to yeah. account right. for that. Vinny had on the thing, it was Got like a hand around up 200. Back here, right? In my line of work, I average about 50 a year mm -hmm. in the Department of Commerce. That's just who come through the Department of Commerce. Out of Alamance County. Out of Alamance County, yes, I just cover Alamance County. That's just 50 that I see. They come through, like some may come through Jay. The Jay sees they'll come to the Department of Commerce. Some may go see Tammy. Some may go Alco Vets. But if you have one location that, can, that, that, that they all know to come to, it can make a good hub. So that, that was my question and my comment is this. We are in desperate need of a strategy for how to spend ARP Funding. I've been saying that. it for six months. I recommended a plan six months ago. We didn't follow it. We've got so many worthy causes. This is one. The the, the nonprofits up the street. When we had that meeting, you know, months ago, uh, is you know, 29 others. Diversion, courthouse. Um, there are massive needs. We have to have a strategy. And Avalanche County itself. And we cannot increase taxes enough to support every veteran in the county. I, I don't know what our taxes would be. We've got to protect the, the full county citizenry of Alamance County. Um, I really support every single veteran. I am so thankful that you, whether you served in combat or not, that you served. But at some point, as Mr. Tarr is indicating, we've got to make some tough decisions. How much land is involved in that Canoodle Center site? It's maybe four acres, about three and a half. I think it's like three and a half. And, and, and if how you many have something like that, that may even get the fire under the city of Burlington to do something with the Western Electric Complex. Well, how, and how many tiny homes could you build? You said there was like a 20,000 square foot. Was that right? The, They've estimated 20 yeah. in that three and a half acreage. And there's on one vet to a house? Unless it's a family. You can have a fam family units as well. Well, I will say this. I mean, a, a tiny home community beside Western Electric with these numbers of people coming in with services uh, would be an economic boom for that, mm -hmm. that side road. But uh, we need, I think we need a strategy. We need to incorporate this as part of uh, a okay. strategy session and, and Start making, start making those tough decisions. We've got to do that. Or we're going to lose this opportunity. Would you fellas be okay if I got in touch with Ben Henry Scott, who's the lead constructionist for that Afghanistan vet, if they would come back and present to you all at the same time in this room? I don't have a problem with that. I will say we have to work fast because they're going to choose the last three locations very soon. And I do know that I think they plan to put one on the East Coast. And I would love to see it be Alamance County. Who else is in the running in this area? I don't, I, we feel like they're going to go to Charlotte, Raleigh, Fayetteville, a bigger city. Some of the larger populations. Yes. But we checked every box because they went over all that as far as how perfectly because we're so centrally located. Um, Can I say yes, something? Sir. My name is Mike Barr. I'm the commander of the VFW 11. Um, the one thing that Alamance County truly has going for us, you mentioned the VA. This area is centralized between both VA centers in this area. There's no, there's no public transit that gets <coughs> veterans from Alamance County to Durham or from Alamance County to Kernersville. This program provides that. The, uh, the other aspect of this is, Doug will tell you, the gentleman from Allied Churches will tell you, not, 
these numbers that they threw out as far as 50 veterans, 20 veterans here, 30 veterans there, not all of us are coming for you guys. They're coming to these guys for help. Some of, some of us are getting phone calls like Alco Vets, like the VFW, where just last year I drove out to the woods in snow camp because a gentleman that somebody paid for him to have a hotel room for a week. At the end of that week, he didn't have a place to go. The homeless shelter here in Burlington is closed on the weekends. So where is he supposed to go? I, maybe I, I, I did not have the honor of serving. I did not. Uh, unfortunately, I could not pass the physical, to be very honest. But would love to have served in the military. Had many, many friends that did serve. Several went to Vietnam and did not return. Close, close friends. Having said that, I would love to have been in those ranks, was not able to do so. Um, I really appreciate veterans. I really appreciate you guys. Many, many friends, close friends, that are veterans right now. Some served in Vietnam, served many, a son-in-law of mine right now, uh, Black Hawk Down, the movie, he was one of the rangers they sent in to bring them out. You're yeah, very proud of him. My uh, great uncle was the first commissioned officer killed out of Guilford County in World War I. His grave site is in France. His tombstone marker is at Bethel Presbyterian Church in Guilford County. Um, I possess the long rifle that Colonel John Paisley, my sixth generation grandfather, used in the Revolutionary War. Many of my family members served in the military, and I really appreciate them and all of you guys. My big question is, what's going on? Why can veterans not go to the VA? Why can they not go to Ms. Crawford's office and get help? And I'd like a, an answer, yes sir. So here's the problem with the VA. Every veteran here will tell you the same thing. You know what their job is? It's not to help us. Their, their job is to figure out a way to minimize the financial impact to the federal government. That's their job. So why are we giving to the VA each year a sizable amount of money? Because, because it's the wool that, the that they pulled over your eye. The VA, do the VA does exceptional work for those that qualify. But if you, don't, if you don't put yourself in that compartmental box, if you're unable to put yourself in that compartmental box, you sit in a waiting room. You sit at your house for six months make an appointment the day the week of the day of they give you a phone call hey sorry we got to cancel your appointment okay when's my next appointment six months from now so we need to shift our money from where we're giving it now to this project is what you're advocating so this projects like this projects like what the veteran service office does here in Graham it provides us a a voice it provides us somebody that is specialized on how to handle those situations. It gives us the guidance on how to put ourselves into that compartmental box so that we can get the assistance or these other veterans can get the assistance that they need. I'm not, God bless me, you know, I have my own issues, I have my own demons that I deal with on a day to day basis, but there are far worse veterans out there that are in worse shape than what I'm in. When I go to the food line up here at uh, church in seven, um, right there where no, it goes into Elon, and there's a home, there's a homeless veteran that set up shop there because they have their flower displays out there. It's raining. He used his tarp to set up there. I go there to pick my son up from work, who's putting carts away to find feet sticking out, not knowing what to do. The guy I picked up from the woods is out in uh, snow camp, 77 year old Vietnam vet, no place to live, it was the middle of summer, 95 degrees outside, and everybody turned him away. 
the VA, the VA couldn't take him on the weekend. They didn't have any assistance. He had to wait till Monday morning. The homeless shelter here in Durham was clo or Burlington was closed. My next option was to take him to the homeless shelter in Durham. They put him outside on the curb. Said, "Hey, if the bed opens up, we'll let you in." So what I do? I brought him back home. I fed him at my table. Put him on my couch. Took him to his appointment for Monday morning. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Yes, sir. If I might, please just take a moment. Uh, I'm blessed. I came back from Vietnam, and uh, after a whole lot of issues, nothing to do with mental facilities or anything. <laughs> but uh, I uh, ran up on an issue and it uh, was told to me by my primary care physician, Dr. Mark Miller, that uh, what was wrong with me was uh, cancer and that uh, being a Vietnam veteran and uh, it was probably due to exposure to Agent Orange, but he's not a military doctor and therefore he can't, I couldn't afford to pay what it was going to cost out of pocket and out of my insurance uh, deductible. So I, I was recommended to go to the VA. Tammy, and then they helped me. And they got me on the right track, filled out the form, sent them in. Six months later, hadn't heard anything. Called the VA. Well, uh, we never got them. Do the same thing, time and time and time again. Even had them tell me one time, we aren't accepting any new patients from the VA in Durham. It took me 10 years to get into the VA with the red tape, the government bureaucracy. And finally, I went in, told my wife, said, take me down there. I went to the missions, pulled a little sticker out to stand in line. I said, you're either going to help me or you're going to put a bullet in my head. I'm not leaving here today without getting some kind of relief. And they set me down and got me in. When I finally went to not a primary care physician, but a physician's assistant and a nurse's assistant, you don't see a doctor unless it's something so bad that they can't help you. And when I finally said, I have been told that my cancer is probably Agent Orange related, they got this far to my face and said, prove it and grin. I had to go through the DOD, all the red tape, all the bureaucracy, time and time again, until I finally got in touch with someone that had lost our, we keep in touch, a lot of us guys were at Don the same time, same place, and kept in touch with a lot of them, and we, they interacted with the ones I couldn't, and they had died from cancer, from Agent Orange exposure, and had been proven. Most of this was from up north. That's takes them to get treated a lot more. We'll put you on out there and take care of you. And they had already died, passed away. And due to their spouses, already having to jump through all those hoops, they had my work log. I was in the Navy in Vietnam. All of a sudden, these people had died. Riverine operations. Agent Orange don't stop. It's not scared of water. It don't. It in our. It don't stop when it gets to water's edge. Yeah. And uh, we had deck logs. Where you went, what time, when, and all of a sudden I could show them with all the paperwork I had to go through with the DOD. Yes, that was Agent Orange during all those times of where he was at. They sent me 11 by 17 manila envelope that thick of daily work logs, deck, sheet, deck logs. And the next time I went to the VA, I pulled it up, put it on the man's, the doctor, the PA's desk, and said, you said I've had to prove it to you? There it is. He opened it up, pulled the first sheet out that far. Yeah, you're approved. We'll get you a physician, get you taken care of. I said, you got a button on your phone right there with DOD. All you got to do is push that button and you could have got the information yourself. He said, it's not worth it for you to push it as far as you can push it. Why would I bother? I said, why don't you want to take care of us better? I'm gonna, he said, I'm going to give you three, three reasons. He said, we would love to help all the vets. You have no idea how many of you there are. 
We can't take care of The United States can't tear up, take care of all you vets for three reasons. We're underfunded, understaffed, and under-resourced. And if it's not worth it for you to push it, we're counting on you not to push it. May I request from every veteran in this room that you contact, starting with the President of the United States and going down to your senators and congressmen. That's, and this thing is from the top down. But it's organizations like this that give us an advocate, that give us a voice to help us get to those people. They're not going to see me. Congressman Walker wasn't going to see me on a day-to-day -day basis. He doesn't know me. I can make, I can make a phone call. I, I have my scout. I'm a scout leader here in Alamance County. I have my scouts write to them all the time. We we get some. They get a response back, and it's every politician. We get a response back from their secretary. Hey, sorry, they weren't able to. We, we really appreciate this. Blah 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 blah. Here you go. Have a nice day. That that's how we get. That's what we get. Without organizations like this, without these veteran service officers, that are willing to advocate for us, we're all gonna get lost in the shuffle. And to be honest with you, from our perspective, nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And uh, give you a, a, an idea, you talk about the ones like which I've done, I wrote my congressman. <laughs> it's just, I'm gonna give you an example. Some of you sitting up there have it arrange to make time, to take time, to make it a priority, to find out what these issues are and what, if anything, you could do to promote help to the people that desperately need it. I got, I got my help. I was persistent. I can tell you right now, over 20 some people that I interact with in the BFW, the American Legion, uh, Vet Connect, uh, Alco Vets, the DAV, that had said, I kept going up, I kept going up, I kept going, kept trying, kept getting the same kind of run around you got. I ain't going no more. I'm just going to go home and sit in the chair and wait till I die. Mm -hmm. We see that all the time, but until people that, we can start right here with the county commissioners, the mayors, our representatives, our senators, all the way up to the national or federal level, and we have to start somewhere. You are there somewhere. And until you people take enough interest, we don't get that next level, next level that you're saying start at the top. It don't work that way. Go to the general and tell him you don't like where you, what's happening in your company. You <laughs> <to get you. laughs> no. so we need to be realistic about this. And bless, bless Pam's heart. I see her more than she remembers me seeing her, even when she's been down to the Vet Connect and Medic talking to us down there, she told us how excited she was about this communities that they put up. That the veterans can come to and have a place and there's people there that can, that can get them that help and get them on that right track, that have connections. And I know that there are some people that are trying to take an interest and we'd appreciate it if all of you would. Thank you. We're going to oh, take a 10 minute break. I've been handed a note that eyeballs are floating after three, <laughs> three hours and 15 minutes. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioners. Um, before you tonight, I have two budget amendments. Um, the first one is a budget amendment to consider transferring $912.56 back to the Alamance Community College Capital Reserve Fund. If you'll recall, back in February of 2021, Dr. Um, Algie Gatewood come over and asked us to appropriate $335,600 for a renovation project for their EMS classrooms. That project is now complete, and we would like to move that balance of $912.56 back to their capital reserve project fund so that they could use it for future projects. So we should approve. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. You again? I'm again. 
So before you tonight, I also have another budget amendment for you to consider, and that would be a budget transfer of $4,580,812 from the county's general fund to the county's capital reserve fund for future capital projects as allowed per our fiscal policy guidelines. Um, the guidelines were adopted and revised back in May, and what that calls for is for us to have an unassigned fund balance project total of 20%. We have exceeded that this year by 2.983%. So what this would allow us to do at the board's discretion would be to transfer those funds of $4,580,812 to the county's capital project reserve fund for future capital projects as well. Motion to approve. I got some questions. Yes, sir. Can you tell me what's in that fund balance? As of now, the, the balance that you have before this 4.5 goes in. Bear with me just a moment. I'm on uh, page uh, 87. <laughs> Absolutely. So, in your, uh, everyone received a copy of the audit tonight. So, on page 112 of that, which are scheduled F1, which is our combined balance sheet, you will see that fund balance for the county buildings is $1,926,262. Thank you. And uh, my next question is just, just for the tape. Mm -hmm. What are you going to use the $5.6 million for? So that would be set aside for future projects that the board could then use and allocate for future projects. And it's just for the county? It's just for the county. This would not benefit ABSS, what's, nor would it benefit Alamance Community College. What's the normal? Um, just, I'm not asking for a particular number, but what's the normal um, amount of money that's in this fund in, in, in any given year? Uh, I'm saying like a, maybe an average balance. What do you think? So where these funds are coming from, and we the, we are in a a different um, position than we have been <coughs> in the past. This is the first time in a very long time that our fund balance has actually met our fiscal policy of 20 percent, and even gone above and beyond that. Um, so you can see if you turn to page 113, which is Schedule F2 in the audit, mm -hmm. last year we started out with $643,248. We did <coughs> add $1.2 million to that, but that was due to debt step down. So as we have paid debt service payments through the course of the year and our debt service payments for the general fund for the things that the county is, so our radios, the uh, rescue truck. As we're paying down that debt service, that has allowed property taxes to then be transferred over to our capital reserve fund to be used for a later project. So at this point in time, there is no specified um, project that we would use those funds, but any requests we would come back to the board and ask for those funds to be allocated. Well, that was my next question. You, you hit on it because this is my <clears throat> next question, I promise. Mm -hmm. um, what is the um, how do I say this? I just want to make sure that we could, could we use some of the money that's in this particular account to, to pay off debt? No. Um, because the general statute, the way that that works is if we are setting aside funds for the capital reserve, then it has to be for a capital project. So would, in your estimation, would it be smart for us to put all this money in this fund if we can only use it for capital? Knowing what capital needs that we are going to have in the coming years, whether that be a diversion center, whether that be the court admin building, other just there may be a surprise, you know, getting a phone call from the maintenance department knowing that an HVAC system has gone out. Having these funds available for that capital need it puts the county in a place that we haven't been in the past. And that is, we have monies that would be available that we wouldn't have to then go to the general fund for. Gotcha. Thank you. You're very welcome. A couple questions, uh, piggybacking on Mr. Lashley. Uh, 
you said so we're in a different state now because our, our we've had mm -hmm. a, a good uh, revenue year there have been times when our fund balance has not equaled 20 percent that's correct what do we do in those situations obviously you don't fund capital reserves but do you have to bring money in from other places we to don't um what we've done in the past um, this past year before we received this audit we were at 15 percent okay and so as long as we are covering our expenditures through the budget process the lgc is fine with that they don't step in they don't try to run our our government um, so what this has done is now that we have met that policy of 20 percent and actually have above of unassigned fund balance this allows us to have the opportunity to transfer that 4.5 to our capital reserve what if you didn't transfer it what if you didn't transfer any of it if it doesn't transfer it just stays in the general fund D cool. does, does it offset I mean if, if we have more this year and say we're in a recession next year and we don't we're back at 15 percent is there any benefit to offs offsetting the shortage from next year with the with the balance for this year so the way that our percentage is calculated is it's a fluid number it changes every year because that calculation is taking the fund balance that we have right. and dividing it by the total number of expenditures for in that the year. general fund for that year right. So if we had a year where we had additional revenue that's coming in and right. it's meeting our expenditures, right. we could have a lower fund balance calculation, right. but it would not, we would not have to then transfer funds back from the capital reserve to the general fund. Okay. What we would do at that point in time is evaluate where we were. Um, same thing that we did last year. We evaluated where we were and knew that we were working toward that goal of reaching the 20%. And that's not through implementing, necess you know, saying we're gonna have a tax increase for that or we're gonna cut department spending by a certain percentage. It's just making those allowances for growth and expansion within the county. And that that's a policy that the old board came up with, am I correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's not a state mandate, it's not a state requirement. We set we came up with what we looked at and felt were some conservative parameters to right. control fun, control the movement of funds among accounts and that was one it's our number if we don't meet it nobody smacks our hand except us right. it's just a number that we came up with and, and charged finance with managing right. and if we do meet it if we're at the 20 percent that's a good thing but it's not particularly a bad thing if we don't meet it it's just that our goal was right. to try and maintain that kind of level of funding that's our target basically the way to to look at this is eight percent equals one month's operation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so being at 20 percent that would allow us if revenues were to stop coming in we could maintain our government though at the current levels for at least two and a half months so that's where the 20 percent comes into play. I'll second Mr. Carter's motion. What was this motion? <laughs> it's been a while back. What yeah, was this motion? Budget amendment. Okay, <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've had a lot of discussion. I'm sorry. We wanted to close session before. After. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions about public speakers and so forth, and uh, Mr. Morowski was kind enough to bring off the board the policy. So I'm going to state right now what that policy is. This is the second comment period. So speaker comments during the second public comment period may be on any topic of public interest. Each public comment period shall be limited to a maximum of 30 minutes. So we will start the clock on 30 minutes and um, County Manager, if you'll mark our 30 minutes when I give you the, the go signal, uh, then we'll limit it to the 30 minutes. Because subjects are special and words, we'll skip that part and However, like regular monthly meetings, these meetings are open to the public uh, for public attendance, and it is an open meeting. 
Ellis County Commissioner shall have a comment uh, commissioner's response period immediately following the uh, comment period, and that's on our agenda. Um, this shall be a point of response for the commissioners to respond to the uh, comments made during, but it is not a debate with the public. It is not. So if you comment, these commissioners will not respond to you. It will be comments from the commissioners themselves as to the topic. Um, each person desiring to speak during the public, public comment period shall have three minutes, and it will be timed, uh, to make his or her remarks. There shall be no more than three speakers. There shall be no more than three speakers on any one topic per meeting. So if we have more than three speaking on a topic, I'm going to give you about three or four minutes to decide who you want to speak for that topic and decide who's for and who's against. And no fist fights. <laughs> That's not in the policy, but it, the sheriff's going to... It's a good policy, <laughs> but... <laughs> it's recommended that uh, speakers desiring to speak uh, on the same topic and uh, advocating for the same position uh, elect one person to speak for that group, but it's still it's limited to three minutes for, per speaker. Yes, that's correct. Any any other additions, uh, any comments regarding that issue? Uh, other than, Thomas, please put that back on the board after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate that. Yep. That's correct. Each speaker gets three minutes, a total of 30 minutes. And if there's, um, it's recommended that speakers speaking on the same topic and advocating the same position choose one person. But it's going to be three speakers on a topic. But you don't have to, is that correct? Yeah. You do not have to, but I'm not going to go into a fourth speaker right. on the well, same subject. Yeah. So I want to give you guys an opportunity to We're size on the same things side up. of the same subject, yeah. that's right. It can be three on each side, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be four. So this is your time. Okay. Our interim county manager is marking the clock at 10:14. First speaker, please approach and state what your topic is and your name and address. So my topic tonight is on um, a noise ordinance on outdoor gun ranges. My name is David Murphy. I live at 5734 Ironwood Drive in Snow Camp. I'd like to thank you for your time tonight. I would not want your job, by the way. Um, but I'm here tonight to ask the commissioners to not um, put up noise ordinance or restriction on outdoor gun ranges. These ranges provide critical training and proficiency of use of firearms. Um, beginning of this meeting, we pledged our allegiance to the flag of the United States to the republic for which it stands we are a constitutional republic so the second amendment affords us the right to have a well-regulated uh, militia now that is actually the public it's actually a call to the public to be proficient and knowledgeable in firearms it's not government oversight but it's the idea that you know we be proficient with those firearms so that a militia might be mobilized we don't have to look past Ukraine to understand the importance of that, right? Amen. Shall not be infringed. That's how it ends. It's a restriction on the government, not the people. I've got several people in snow camp around me that fire on a regular basis. They shoot on a regular basis. I would never complain to the county about a noise ordinance. Why? Because it sounds like freedom to me. And the second, who am I to ask you to infringe on somebody else's constitutional right? I'm a combat veteran. That's what I fought for. A noise ordinance would put outdoor gun ranges, owners, and their management in an unfair situation with faced with unfair burdens. More importantly and concerning to me, it would do the same for the patrons who are the citizens of your county. So, and I believe an ordinance may be infringement on our Second Amendment rights. 
We've got attacks on our rights all sides. We're chipping away at them slowly and slowly. We as citizens and elected officials need to be very vigilant to protect our constitutional rights. So tonight, I just ask you, don't go down a slippery slope. I've got neighbors that shoot around. You put restrictions on a gun range, next thing you know, you're knocking on my neighbor's door saying you can't do that anymore. Right? So let's not be that kind of elected officials. Let's not be that kind of citizens. Let's support that Second Amendment. So I ask you to just consider no doors ordinance on outdoor gun ranges. I appreciate your time. And we thank you. Thank, thank you. you. What did you say your name was? I was writing David everything Murphy. you said. David Murphy. Thank you. It's the fourth name on your okay. agenda. Thank you. Is there anyone um, for the noise ordinance? There being none, your second speaker. John, I don't want to... Uh, I've never been to one of these meetings before, and uh, it's kind of interesting, but uh, i got to say my blood is boiling after listening to the plight of our veterans. And it's, it's just got me so enraged. I, on the way over here today, I heard that our government spent $17 million on hotel reservations for illegals. And if that isn't a cancer in our leadership, I, I can't imagine what would be worse. So I, I'll, I'll try to get myself calmed down and talk about what I came here for. Uh, my property is directly the closest, actually my property borders the range property, okay? And uh, it's, uh, and give, I can Give us your name again. Richard Clark, I'm and sorry. And your address. Uh, my uh, business address is 2557 Fawcett Lane. It's right, right up against the range. I can look through uh, a tree, uh, light row of trees, and I can see the targets. Uh, and I estimate they're about 100 <coughs> yards away. And uh, uh, the only time I ever hear the gunshots are the first two or three shots. And after that, I don't even hear it. Okay, now, you know, sometimes certain noises bother certain people. I used to have a dog that barked a lot, and it really got on my neighbor's nerves, but it never really hurt their hearing. And uh, a few years back, I was granted a patent along with three other doctors that, uh, that they tested, did a thorough test at Indiana State on the, that, that uh, uh, hearing test set up. It was designed to be field, done in the field. because. Uh, so I've been in audio. I've been in the audio business for 45 years, as you know, and uh, I've always uh, been concerned and, and that hearing was an important part of the audio business. I mean, you know what I mean. And uh, so uh, they, uh, this idea that I had, they uh, spent a lot of time uh, proof in that at the at the university there. And uh, it turns out that I was granted a patent on, on that, hear that hearing test method. Uh, and my hearing's always been important to me. If I go shoot a gun, I have really nice custom-made earplugs. Uh, okay, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, mine were made by Etymotic Research. I knew Dr. Mee Killen real well. And uh, so all I can say is, the noise levels, based on my experience, if it's done right, measured A weighted, slow scale, at my shop, which is the closest building to the targets, okay, of, of anybody, uh, I, I, it's it's not it's not anything that's going to hurt anybody. I'm, I'm real confident about that. Now, if they start shooting cannons or something like that, uh, <laughs> that's another thing, and maybe tossing grenades around. But as long as it, as long as it just stays like it is with, with rifles, uh, and uh, I, I just absolutely don't have a problem with it. I don't even hear it. And then, and then the next thing, you know, I hear it, and then I don't hear it, and I totally ignore it. And my employees, they don't have any problem with it either. And they say the same thing. If they quit shooting for a while, oh, I'm out of time. <laughs> okay, never Thank mind. You. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. I was supposed to look at that, but 255. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can I uh, hand these out real quick to you guys? 
I bought you some uh, informational packets. Give your name first. Oh, it's uh, Rudy Carcassi. I live in uh, Mebane, North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Rudy Carcassi. Uh, I live in 270 Steel Street, Mebane, North Carolina. Uh, I'm one of the owners of Rad Range and Rad Industries. Uh, there before you have a packet in front of you. Uh, like the previous gentleman said before, we are a nation of laws. The right of people keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, uh, which we all know that. Uh, as you can see right there, on page 133 is the tax record and a map. Uh, note the land use is a country club for shooting or a sport club. Okay, that's very important. Also, check the parcel ID number two, uh, date 725 2013. So, as you can see there, uh, Red Range bought the property but it was already uh, in a trust, which is just how you would title a property. On the third page, you can see the map uh, where he was talking about where his shop is at and where the range, those arrows, is where the shooting directions are at. So that other looks like a little hatchet right there. That's part of our property there. Uh, if you look at page four is the Limited Liability Corporation. Is that this what is you're showing is a buffer? Right, is that, well, that's one of the buffers. It's part of the range, but that's included in there, and then it goes back. Um, if you look at the Limited Liability Corporation, the legal name. Me, were you saying that's part of Mr. or next to Mr. No, that's ours. Property. Those are our two pieces of property. Okay. So you have one as a range, one as a buffer. It's that little hatchet part. All right. Uh, Limited Liability Corporation, Lighthouse Plantation. Uh, notice that was 10-8-2014. Uh, and then the next one is the copy of their FFL, which was also at Jim Barnwell Road. So they had a federal firearms license there around that same time. And then the next one is a copy of ours. As you notice on the bottom, you'll see there's an SOT. If Terry Johnson was still here, he'd tell you we signed for it. Yes, we shoot machine guns there. They're not illegal. We're allowed to possess them and manufacture them for military and testing purposes. So we do have that. That's the rapid fire. The next page is going to be your Article 53 Shooting Club Protection Act. This does protect us by state law. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's in there. We bought the property. There was a lease that was done for transfer of it, and then we bought the property. So there was no discontinuing business. This law does protect us. Um, also, level of noise real quick. I ain't got much time. I put this in here, and these are the noise and decibels. I actually spent the time and did the math since I'm really good at numbers. As you can see here, yes, it's in my chicken scratch. But at 800 feet before I broke the calculator, the decibels go down minus 84. So if a gunshot is at 140, and they took a reading at basically 30 meters off the range, like he was stated before, there you go. It's at 115. As it goes, propagates out, it gets less and less and less and less. It's not on an aggregate one-to-one -one scale. It's like a 1 to 1.7 scale. Um, the next one is the meaning of the gentleman who said that. If you notice real quick, i got 15 seconds. He lives over a mile and a half, a mile and a quarter away. There's no way dynamite explosions are rallying his dishes, and especially gunshots. The next gentleman from the next mean lives 1,013 feet away, and they were in the woods. You can look at our Facebook video and see that. And the closest person that lives in the rental house. Thirty more seconds because Mr. Carter. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to go through <laughs> as fast as I can and save time. Uh, just bear with me. Um, the closest distance from the rifle range to a rental house of the property is over. 1,871 feet. So in conclusion with that, um, and you guys can look over this, you know, we have over 150 paying members out of the county that generates revenue for the county. Um, the people have a right to shoot in the county because we can't shoot in the city. We need to protect that right. Uh, and that's why I'm asking the county commissioner to protect the right of people shooting in this county. And have a good night, and thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them for you. Thank you, Rudy. Thank, thank you. I would have gotten You're one of the few that will ever get 30 extra seconds. <laughs> <laughs> A strategic move. Yeah, it's a strategic move. Thank you. 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 We had David Simmons, we had, uh, but he would be anti noise. Thank you. Step down so they can speak. And Caitlin Simmons, I assume yes. that's who you are. <laughs> I saw you all trying to not speak. <laughs> <laughs> and you got it. You won. We'll come back. We'll come back and okay. <laughs> and General Dwayne, I think, already spoke in our, in our previous <laughs> section of the meeting. Yeah. Are there any other, I, I don't have any other. 
That's it. Okay, excellent. Okay, commissioner's response, if any. I might want to make a comment about something that came up earlier tonight. Um, I know that most, after we finish a, a closed session, most everybody in here will be gone, and if I don't make it now, it won't get made in front of anybody. So, um, re relative to what some of the veterans have been speaking to, my, my mother-in-law was a was a wife of a World War II vet and a widow of a World War II vet. Um, Tammy, who's not here now, did an excellent job of helping her file her work, her her material for her to get long-term care. She was going through dementia. Um, unfortunately, what we've learned is that a lot of situations when they reach that point, the, the VA will wait six months before they respond. It'll take them six months at least to respond. And they, whether they know that or not, whether it's, a, I'm not gonna make any accusations against anybody about whether it's uh, intentional or not, but you know, a lot of people don't make it six months. She didn't. Well, when you file that, when you make that claim, you're supposed to, at the six month point, if you get approved, you're supposed to get retroactive funding to your date of your claim. But if you don't survive for the six months, you, your family who've paid out that money, get nothing. And I'm seeing a few heads nod here, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, we got a we got a problem, folks. I, I realize that. I, I mean, that was a minuscule for, for us. That was a minuscule problem, but praise the Lord, I can say that. But for a lot of people, it's not. For a lot of people, it's just not a minuscule problem. Just had one comment as to in part of the materials that you handed up, uh, North Carolina General Statute 14-409.46. Uh, I'll repeat that, 14-409.46 states in part, a person who owns, operates, or uses a sport shooting range that you pointed out, um, in the state shall not be subject to civil liability or criminal prosecution in any matter relating to noise or noise pollution resulting from the operation or use of the range. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got that state law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do an ordinance, do we? Okay, let's move on to County Commissioner. Uh, county manager, excuse me. <laughs> You're number six. You are. Right. Yeah, that's all right. So, Steve pointed out I'm a county commissioner. <laughs> so he had a question. Who had a question? Was, uh, was that just a statement or was that a question? That was just a statement. Clarification. I was just Good making sure that the folks in <laughs> TV land oh, okay. understand. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, commissioners, the last few meetings we have talked a little bit about great grant and I just wanted to let you guys know that we have had a last minute request for Lumen, CenturyLink, Brightspeed to put in a request for great grant consideration. So this would be our fourth, um, our fourth company to, cons uh, to consider and Bruce is going to briefly give us details on um, what their proposal is and then we would be asking for the board to um, commit um, to vote on a commitment of support for this as well. What was the name of the company? It is three three companies together: Lumen, CenturyLink, and Brightspeed. And let me say, you guys are welcome to stay, but you're also welcome to leave if you choose to do so. Uh, it's only. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't threaten, don't threaten sharing with us. Run. <laughs> Run. <laughs> Now you know why I made my comment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
All right, Bruce, let's have it. Let's make it quick, right? So, so again, this came late Thursday. We got a couple phone calls that said, hey, we'd like to propose. One of them, I said, I said if you got a shovel ready, ready to go project, because just because they extended that month, these folks came. But um, the one company said, we're not ready. I said, well, talk to us in the fall when there's more federal dollars. This one was shovel ready he got me to that, that that afternoon so we could not get in the agenda so this last minute just a consideration from you all um, so basically it's Lumen which was who owns CenturyLink we all know CenturyLink and Mevin who's now been acquired by Brightspeed okay so so is that Brightspeed looping over to Lumen and then CenturyLink is that what's happening yeah exactly. that's the chain yeah they're chain, they're getting CenturyLink over to Brightspeed um, yeah, so, but they had their ducks in a row, so they talked, this is their slides they sent, so it, full disclosure, I, I, try, I try to show everything. So again, preliminary, based on preliminary data, we're going to show you a map, it also is based on the requirements, is 25 megabytes uh, per second download, three, which is the really, really, really slow. These are all federal re regulations for this, but based basically we talk about again the max fund per application is four million again at the bottom Brightspeed has the agreement to acquire Lumen's assets in North Carolina Brightspeed will take responsibility of these builds in the close of the deal so they are proposing um, a project in the Mevin area in the Central Link area you can see that map um, the request from County ARPA funds would be a hundred thousand dollars okay um, and so you see that, uh, what's it, excuse me, state grant, they estimate is 2.14 uh, 2 million, request from the county be 100,000 in art funds, uh, and they would provide 815,000. This is a close up of the area. Um, Go back to the other slide, please. Yes, sir. All right, so we're asked to invest 100,000. Yes, sir. And we get a total of 2.14 plus 815. Plus 100, yeah. 3.05. That's their estimation, yeah. give or take. Again, they, they are the applicant. They apply based on the state rules, okay? So the state double checks everything. <coughs> they, could, they could be off, you know, and, and so we say up to 100,000, not to exceed. Uh, that's the same exact MOU. We talked with Deborah about this ahead of time. So we invest a hundred, we get three million by. Right. So I was going to go over this again. So just compare to April fourth to this time. At that time, I said the three projects that we had would not up to at most five hundred thirty-one thousand two hundred four dollars of great of art funds would equal eight up to eight million dollars investment. In, in the median of that time, North State came back and said, we don't need as much from Alamance County. We're going to fund more of that. So that number reduced itself by 250000 Really? Yes. And so today's net is $381,204 for the four projects. Okay. And again, the four projects in total equal $12 million of state funding. Wow. So they only commit eight million per county in the beginning of spring. So there's going to be winners and losers. So it will probably be less than that. But we, in the process of being a partner to all four of the applicants until the state does its review and picks the winners, we're making a commitment to each one. But in reality, they're not going to give us twelve million dollars worth of investments. Only the eight from the state with our funds. So it should be a lesser money than that. But I have to tell you the worst case scenario just to, to fill you in. But again, this is a fourth player, more competition. They got to fight harder for that funding from the state. So I'm a big advocate of competition for our citizens. It usually means a lower price. Um, again, they, they got everything I needed in time. So I said I would present it to you all. And if you want me to con continue in the same capacity we did with the other we have the same we have one particular MOU a reason for everybody and we got one letter 
and it's just basically a statement that we're committed to this if the state approves them and they win you know I got a question yes sir once this infrastructure is in place we got four different providers yep at four different locations sure is there some overlap actually right oh, up to four providers in yes, four sir. different locations at some point will there be open competition across that grid so that if somebody was with hypothetically AT&T in one and they wanted to switch to somebody else for that fiber optic, optic service could they then do that at some point or is it locked in it, it's their lines okay so they would have to sell their lines to somebody else okay um, That's what but that being said you know North State is coming in to the area made a huge statement a commitment so that's an additional competition this bright side is acquiring central link which is a current player but again that's who's to say what's coming the other player that did not come on time they're from virginia as well and they're going to be a player later in the year so i went to charlotte two or three years ago to understand more about this broadband and my gosh they have the plethora of competition that we would die for and and you know, our consumer would be the benefit of that. Our businesses and consumer would be the benefit of that. Right. So more competition really helps us out. And they overlap each other and compete. And when they overlap, then they say, oh, well, this guy's paying me $10. You know, I'm paying 50 bucks a month for internet. How about over here? What's you gonna do for me? That kind of thing. So again, going back to the need, it really helps that. And then obviously these federal dollars are getting the, comp the big boys coming out in competition. and allowing competition to come into a new area and establish themselves so again to keep it short if you want us to pursue with this hundred thousand uh, dollar from bright space bright speed excuse me we can do that and if they make it in time for the May we'll get the information to them when they apply we'll find out June, uh, June July who won and who didn't win so So moved. I'll second. Yeah, uh, any other questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Sure. I'm sure to get excited talking about all that stuff. <laughs> well, just like you, I get the phone calls of, like, what are you going to do to help me? Yeah. And, and can you compel Charter to do this? And we can't. They're a private business. But this allows them to expand and telehealth tele we're going to really benefit that's what matters thank you so much do you have anything else i'm done thank you all right commissioner's responses um commissioner comments no. yes. <coughs> i have i have one mr chairman and it relates to uh to the last to last meeting that we had and the vote that the commission took on the support of charter school uh, mr morcom's request for a charter school in alamance county um I think my my position is not clear, and I want to I want to state it. I want to make it clear. Uh, I support 100% charter schools in Alamance County. I support parents and student choice 100% in Alamance County. We could not um, have the education that we have in the county if we didn't have all options for students. Public traditional, public virtual, charter, private, homeschooling. It's all essential. And if any part of that broke down, we wouldn't have the same educational system in the county. Um, and I've been the benefit of parental choice. I mean, at some time, a couple of my kids were in private school. Now I've got three kids in public school. So I've benefited from that, and I know the value of having that choice. Um, I, I do want to explain my, my vote a little bit more on that. I voted not to, um, to go forward with the county approval of the letter of support for Mr. Morcom's idea. Um, and that wasn't a no on the idea. It was an, a, a no so that we could have a little bit more time to evaluate it. Mr. Morcom came to the podium and he had some additional materials um, in hard copy that he wanted to present to the state, which we hadn't had an opportunity to see. Uh, and he also asked that we that the county, uh, through ABSS, lead the new charter school uh, and that the county vouch for or set up a bonding agency for, for that effort, which I didn't see was um, the, the statutes provided us the authority to do that and so I wanted to make sure that that we weren't vouching for a process that was not authorized by state law and so that was why I voted no uh, the chair and, and three others wanted to move forward um, and, and so we did I would have taken a, a couple extra days 
Uh, I think Mr. Morcom's deadline to have everything submitted was April 29th, which would allow us at this meeting or even before the special meeting to, to weigh in on that after we had a little bit of a deeper dive. So that was the rationale for that. I support charter schools. I support, support parents' choice unequivocally uh, and just wanted to state that for the record. Thank you. We appreciate the clarification. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I think, because I was with you, I think it was just the letter. It wasn't the school. Because right. mine started out in private school at Burlington Day School. Then we went to public. So I think parents need to pick and choose where their kids go and their kids need to be happy at that school, whatever it looks like. County Attorney. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the County Attorney's report at this time, I ask that the Commissioners make a motion for the board to go into closed session pursuant to general statute chapter 143-318.11 under the fall under the section subsection a3 to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney client privilege between the attorney and the public body which privilege is hereby acknowledged in addition, the motion made under subsection A3 is, is to identi also identifies the following parties and existing lawsuit concerning the public body, which the public body expects to receive advice during the closed session. And pursuant to, state, to law, I need to read the names of the parties of the lawsuit, so bear with me. Um, the NC State Conference of the NAACP, NAACP Alamance County Branch 5368, Down Home NC, Engage Alamance, Dreama Caldwell, Tamara Kersey, Reverend Dr. Daniel Kuhn, Reverend Randy Orwig, Marianne Shanahan Plaintiffs versus Alamance County, Alamance County Board of Commissioners, Commissioner Steve Carter, William Lashley, Pamela Thompson, John Paisley, Craig Turner Jr. in their official capacities, and the lawsuit of plaintiffs Gregory Drumright, Edith Ann Jones, Justice for the Next Generation, Quincillan Ellison, M.E. a minor by through their guardian, Z.P. a minor by and through his guardian, Faith Cook, Melanie Mitchell, J.A. by and through her guardian, B.A. by and through her guardian, Janet Nesbitt, Ernestine Lewis Ward, Edith Ward, Avery Harvey, Ashley Reed Batten, Corey Moore, Brendan Key, Jasmine Breeden, plaintiffs versus Terry Johnson in his official and individual capacities, Alamance County Sheriff, Cliff Parker individually and officially in his capacity, Randy Denham individually in his official capacity, David Sykes individually in his official capacity, Chip Cobb individually and in his official capacity, uh, Jonathan Franks in his individual capacity, Barbara Tomey, in individually in an official capacity, Chad Martin individually in official capacity, Daniel Nichols, James McAleland, Peter Trillio, Chandler Weger, James McAvey, Mark Doctry, also all in their individual official capacities, Mary Christine Cole, individually Joaquin Velez, Dwan Floyd, Rodney King, Noah Sacken, Eric Jordan, Robert Parks, Justin Hopkins, Joshua <laughs> Payne, John Way, <laughs> You're out of time. <laughs> time is up. B. Land, Keith Kirkman, Clint Cross, Chad Boggs, Steven, Scott Nudiker, Christopher Dunnigan, and Jonathan Taylor individually and the city of Graham. So I, I ask that they, you make that motion. That's so right. that That's Can right. you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All in favor, say the bottom say aye. Aye. We're back in session. Uh, we've already had a motion second and voted to go out of the closed session. Um, do we have any other motion as in to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Signify Don't we have to make a statement that... No, there's no action needed. Right. There's okay. no action and needed. we didn't take any action. Yeah, there was no action. We didn't take any action. Yeah, that's what I meant. We usually make a statement that we didn't take any action. That's call, correct. We'll, Thank we'll you. Calm yes. down. We're going to say all in favor. Aye. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.com 
lovetvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.